not comfortable quite comfortable hmm so you will be sharing the the the, the presentation yes yes i will be sharing everything yeah sure. from this side only we will be presenting the cases sure. one by one and uh, then uh, we will be doing that way like yesterday only yes yes exactly the same sure. <laughs> and i'll request all the people who are not actively answering the particular question to kindly switch off their mics because that otherwise causes a bit of a confusion sometimes will you start with calcium i suppose yeah we'll start with calcium i have shared the youtube link as well on the whatsapp yes. group so if people yes. have a problem in accessing through zoom somebody you can just stream from there yeah it is Again, join. So see, see, data that I'm able to join it without any hindrance or not. Yeah, sure, okay. sure, sure. Ah, uh, let's see. Okay, so we are going live in a couple of minutes, exactly at two o'clock. With the first session will be calcium. We already have all the panelists here: Dr. Anamika, Dr. Chizam, and Dr. Rashmi. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Pradeep could not join in, so we already redistributed the cases accordingly. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome all to the next session of the International Practical Pediatric Endocrine Course. Yesterday we had four extensive sessions which were there, and today we will be continuing with a session focusing on key aspects of pediatric endocrinology, predominantly with regards to the 
emergency medicine. So we'll be focusing about in-hospital issues, particularly about the calcium disorder, the electrolyte disorders, DK, and hypoglycemia. So just to touch base upon the basics of uh, why we are doing this course and how we'll carry forward the sessions today. So uh, this is our third uh, virtual program. We have been doing a lot of online programs already. So this is a third virtual program in which we are focusing using virtual tools to focus on practical pediatric endocrinology. All of you can have a go and look at our website, which has a lot of modules related to pediatric endocrinology, a number of courses which are available, along with multiple grand rounds and PG lecture series, which we conduct every month, which can be done complementarily in that regards. We already have publications which can be accessed. Our mobile application, which is useful for point of care evaluation, will showcase about the DK tool, which is a validated arm in that perspective. And this is something which will help on that and the future of the personalized intelligent EMR, which is going to come up in the next year, which will help personalize guidance along with our courses, the fellowship program, which is a hybrid program in pediatric endocrinology, both online as well as on-site program in which people do visit to our center along with online learning and diploma courses, also a hybrid program for pediatricians in that regard. So this is our second day of the program and focus about calcium electrolyte, DK, and hypoglycemia. We have got a number of faculty who have joined across the globe for these sessions. So we'll have four extensive sessions over the next uh, four hours. So we'll cover around uh, 100 cases will be there, which will be covered over this period of this entire two-day sessions. A lot of cases to discuss. So we'll start on, on that. The format is pretty simple. We will first have the baseline discussion about the various aspects of that particular disorder to set the space. And then we move forward from there with regards to the specific questions and panel, which will be discussed from that perspective. So I will be starting off uh, with the first session on calcium disorders. And this is basically going to focus about three major disorders, which is hypocalcemia, rickets, and hypercalcemia. Now for this session, uh, we have got three very eminent experts from across the various parts of the globe. We have got uh, Dr. Anamika Saha from Dhaka, Dr. Chizam, who is from Nigeria, and Dr. Rashmi Nagraj from Mysore. Dr. Sain will be joining me to discuss the various cases with the experts. Now, Dr. Anamika Saha is uh, a consultant pediatrician in uh, Bhuapur uh, in Bangladesh. She is a consultant pediatrics and in charge of the pediatric endocrine clinic. And she has done a lot of publications related to various aspects of growth disorders and vitamin D in different journals across both national as well as international journals. Dr. Chizam is a consultant pediatrician and lecturer in the Department of Pediatrics uh, in uh, Anambra, Nigeria, and she's actually the head of endocrinology, hematology, oncology unit, and she has been extensively involved with our programs over the last three years and has multiple index publications and presentations across the globe. Dr. Rashmi Nagraj is uh, the associate professor of uh, JSSMT Medical College, Mysore, and she's currently undergoing a fellowship program as well. A lot of publications related to pediatric endocrinology, particularly type 1 diabetes, book chapters, and research projects. So before we go ahead with the various case-based scenarios, we'll start with a bit of pathophysiology. So we all know 99% of all calcium in the body is in the bone and only 1% of it can be exchanged on that. So bone is something which is actually storing it, but it's not very easy to give the calcium out. Now, out of the circulating calcium, around 40% is bound to albumin. 10% is bound to other anions like phosphorus and around 50% is free, which is ionic calcium. So when we talk about hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia, we should actually look at ionic calcium and not total calcium because that depends upon albumin. So especially in conditions like nephrotic syndrome where the albumin levels may be low or conditions like myelomas where you may have high proteins, you may theoretically have a pseudo hypocalcemia or pseudo hypercalcemia, which may happen. The other thing which determines the binding of the calcium to the albumin is the pH. So in conditions which are associated with alkalosis, be they respiratory alkalosis or metabolic alkalosis, the anionic component of albumin goes up. Therefore, the free calcium goes down. So if you have a neonate who is hyperventilating or if you have somebody who has a chronic renal failure who has a covert hypocalcemia, you give soda bicarbonate 
you are raising the pH, you are raising the anionic albumin, you are reducing calcium. So alkalosis can therefore cause reduced ionic calcium and precipitate hypocalcemia. And this happens in hyperventilation and soda bicarbonate treatment, a very important point to consider in that perspective. Now, when we talk about calcium, we need to understand that there are three major organs which are regulating it. Bone is basically there as a store, but in acute states, it can provide certain amount of action. So it can really provide you immediately. So if you are in dire need, you can use your ATM to get the calcium out. The intestine is a chronic regulator. So you have long-term regulations happening through intestine and kidneys do not play a very major role in calcium metabolism, but they can bear the brunt of calcium. So if you have too much calcium, you may have hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. So acute regulation is largely done through bones. And like there are three organs, there are three major hormone systems which regulate the whole process. The most important of this is parathyroid hormone. Now the parathyroid hormone regulates everything. It has an effect on the bone to get the calcium out from there. It has an effect on the kidneys to cause conservation of calcium. It also has an effect of increasing calcitriol production and indirectly causing an intestinal absorption. So PTH basically increases calcium by increasing bone resorption, increasing gastrointestinal absorption and reducing the renal calcium excretion. Now, when PTH increases calcium, it also causes loss of phosphorus. So if you have high PTH, you will have hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. So if you have an individual whose calcium is high and phosphorus is also high, you cannot have hyperparathyroidism. Similarly, if you have low PTH, hypoparathyroidism or pseudohypoparathyroidism, you would expect that calcium will be low, but phosphorus will be high. If you have low calcium, low phosphorus, PTH abnormality becomes very less likely. So the major player is PTH. It has an opposite effect on calcium and phosphorus. Now, calcitriol is a major factor which regulates the intestinal absorption. The main role of vitamin D is to increase the amount of calcium which is absorbed by the intestine from around 20 to 30% to around 50 60%. So this is the only role vitamin D does and it increases the blood calcium level. Now vitamin D also increases the phosphorus absorption. So if your calcium goes up because of vitamin D, your phosphorus also goes up. So if you have conditions which are associated with vitamin D excess, you will have hypercalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. If you have vitamin D deficiency, you will have hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia. So the most important investigation to be done in a child with calcium disorder is actually phosphorus, which will give you a clear cut picture. Anybody with hypocalcemia, if they have high phosphorus, look at renal failure and look at PTH abnormality. Anybody who has hypercalcemia has a high phosphorus, think of a vitamin D cause. This is something you need to evaluate from that perspective. Now, all this is sensed by the calcium sensing receptor. If this receptor becomes hyperactive, body will say, okay, your calcium is very high. It will reduce PTH causing hypocalcemia, but lose urinary calcium causing hypercalciuria. So hypocalcemia with hypercalciuria. If there is an inactivating mutation, you will have the opposite picture in which the PTH will become high, but kidneys are conserving the calcium. So you will have hypercalcemia with hypocalciuria. So when you have hypercalcemia, another important investigation is urinary calcium. And we'll show all those cases today when we're discussing about that, how these all relevant physiological tools become important from that perspective. So hypocalcemia, chronic hypocalcemia is very significant. We often miss it. But anybody who has seizures, cardiac failure, very important in the newborn period. Any seizures in the infantile period, definitely even beyond that, calcium should be looked at. One thing often missed out is ectopic calcification. So if you have basal ganglia calcification, it means there is a long-standing hypocalcemia. Similarly, uncontrolled headache could be benign intracranial tension because of hypocalcemia, strider, and cataract. So any of these conditions you need to evaluate. Any newborn who is preterm, who is low birth weight, or who has a cardiac defect suggestive of Dijord syndrome, 
also we need to evaluate for hypocalcemia. Now, how do we look for calcium levels? The calcium levels should ideally be done in a serum sample using a fasting sample. The problem, as I discussed, is if your albumin is low, you will have a falsely low level of calcium. And if your protein is high, you will have a falsely high pseudo hypo and pseudo hypercalcemia. Now, you have formulas by which you can calculate for every one gram decrease in albumin, you should add 0.8 milligram per DL. So this is the formula for corrected calcium or you can get an ionic calcium, which is a more reliable marker in that perspective. Now, phosphorus again has to be done in the morning in a fasting state because if you eat something, insulin will be secreted and insulin will cause decrease in phosphorus level because phosphorus will be pushed into the cells. The caution here is that do not use a tonique, do not squeeze because it's an intracellular ion and it will come out and cause high phosphorus in a false fashion. And very importantly, use age specific level. Often you are giving reports in which you get the adult levels, but children have a higher level. So in infancy, you can tolerate phosphorus up to 8 milligram per DL, childhood up to 6 and adulthood up to 4.6. So very important, age specific levels of phosphorus have to be looked out in that perspective. Now, very important to remember, we discussed yesterday about FT4 and TSH, that there is a log linear relationship. Similarly, there is a relationship which is sigmoid relationship between calcium and PTH. So what happens is that if your calcium is low, your PTH should really go up high. So anybody who has hypocalcemia should have a PTH which is very high. If your PTH is low or normal, this would mean that there is an inappropriately low level of PTH which suggests hypoparathyroidism. So always look calcium and PTH, FT4 and TSH, glucose and insulin in the corresponding level that you actually look at the right time to assess in that perspective. Now, how do we approach hypocalcemia? I already said that if you have to look at, first of all, other things like hypoalbuminemia, phosphorus load, and very important to look at magnesium. Anybody with refractory hypocalcemia, look at hypomagnesemia you want to evaluate. Look at phosphorus. If phosphorus is high, it is a very rare scenario. You're dealing with two things, either renal failure or you're dealing with a PTH cause. So if your creatinine is high, this is chronic kidney disease. If it's normal, look at PTH. You classify into hypo and pseudo hypo parathyroidism. Now, one caveat is that if you have long standing vitamin D deficiency, you may have a secondary PTH resistance. So if you have hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia and normal creatinine, particularly in an early age group, two months, three months, always do a vitamin D before you label them as pseudo hypoparathyroidism. If your phosphorus is low, then you can look at vitamin D dependent causes, vitamin D deficiency or resistance. So this is what will be the rare scenario. So we'll now start off with the cases. Dr. Cyan will now start with the grand round brief. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction to the uh, calcium disorders. Now, moving forward to the cases, this was a four-month-old boy being treated for nephrotic syndrome, presented to us with a calcium of 7.2. Now, the child was asymptomatic on referral. Now, with the 7.2 being asymptomatic was uh, not, uh, uh, I couldn't explain these symptoms. So, Dr. Anamika, can you just help me? A child of nephrotic syndrome, 7.2, but without any symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Well, in this scenario, uh, a child with nephrotic syndrome having asymptomatic hypocalcemia, we should estimate the corrected calcium level and ionic calcium level first. Because we know, we already know that 40% of circulating calcium bound to uh, albumin and albumin is usually low in nephrotic syndrome patient. So in this patient, the albumin level, if we estimate the albumin level, it's uh, uh, we this patient that it was... it's low. Yeah, in this patient, it was two grams per liter. Two grams is, uh, uh, as expected, the albumin level is low. So now we uh, will measure the corrected calcium level. We know the formula that is measured calcium plus normal albumin four minus measured albumin and into 0.8 milligram per day. So the corrected level is 8.8, .8, which is normal at this age. 
So the child had pseudo hypocalcemia due to low albumin level. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the key message are before initiating extensive workup for hypocalcemia, we should correct the calcium level according to albumin level. And ironic calcium uh, is preferred to uh, total calcium level to avoid the interference of these binding factors. Yeah, this is a very important message that ironic calcium should be preferred in such cases as we can uh, falsely label pseudo hypocalcemia as true hypocalcemia. Uh, moving forward to the next case. Now, this was a four year old girl hypocalcemia. This time we did ironic calcium. This was 3.1 and the child was symptomatic. Phosphorus very high. Phosphorus was 8.4. PTH was also high. So we think this case is a case of pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Do you agree, Dr. Chisholm? Um, thank you, Dr. Sion. Now this case is um, an interesting case because for a child with hypocalcemia, the first thing you should expect is a low phosphorus level because of secondary hyperparathyroidism. But here we are having very high phosphorus level, very high PTH level with um, a presumptive diagnosis of uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So the first thing to do anytime you get a phosphorus level that is very high is to assess the serine creatinine level to rule out CKD. So what was the serine creatinine level in this yeah. child? Dr. The creatinine was 2.4. And that is very high. So this child clearly has um, chronic kidney disease. And if you think about it, chronic kidney disease can give you hypocalcemia. Chronic kidney disease can lead to hyperphosphatemia. And at the same time, it can lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism. So it's more or less masquerading as pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So it's very important for any child with hypocalcemia, if you get a high phosphorus level, always check the serine creatinine to rule out CKD. And if the serine creatinine is normal, then you can entertain the possibility of either a PTH and problem, either in function or in the creatinine, that's in the concentration. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this wonderful message. This is the message that Sir also gave and Dr. Chisholm also wonderfully uh, told us. If low calcium and high phosphorus always rule out a CKD before moving forward to PTH. The next case, now we have a one-year-old boy, again symptomatic, again low calcium. The phosphorus is doing normal. Again, PTH is low. And in spite of repeated admissions, we give him IV calcium. He responds for that moment, but immediately after going back from the hospital, he starts again to seizure. So Dr. Rashmi, is it the straightforward case of hypoparathyroidism not being treated adequately? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sayan. Good afternoon, dear all. Uh, actually, here, uh, it's a frank case of hypocalcemia, which is not responding to IV calcium. And uh, parathormone is a uh, little towards lower limit of normal. So the next thing we have to think about is uh, do a magnesium because any intractable hypocalcemia or a refractory hypocalcemia, after giving adequate doses of uh, calcium gluconate, that is one ml per kg per dose, diluted one is to one. Uh, if it's not responding, always think next magnesium. So uh, what was yeah, the magnesium? The magnesium was 0 0.42 milligrams per deciliter in this case. So it's quite obvious that there is a clear-cut hypomagnesemia and the magnesium level is uh, quite low. So in this case, uh, uh, since magnesium is important for the release of parathormone and uh, hypomagnesium, hypomagnesemia can clearly cause hypocalcemia. So we have to correct uh, yeah. hypomagnesemia in the first place by giving uh, uh, 0.2 ml per kg of 50% max self uh, IM. Yeah. But uh, this seems to be uh, severely low, actually, yeah, the because, magnesium uh, levels. This uh, problem uh, started very early. Yeah, and also the problem has started very early and uh, the magnesium level is also uh, significantly low. So probably we may have to think of a genetic defect here yeah. also. Yeah. And his elder brother also had same problems and we yeah. did a genetic test and this is what came out. Yeah, uh, this, is a, uh, this is actually a TRMP channel defect, six channel defect. These channels, when they become non-functional, uh, they hinder the absorption, intestinal absorption of magnesium, and are also uh, they increase the urine output, I mean, the urinary excretion of magnesium. So it's a permanent problem. So this requires uh, administration of very high dose of magnesium and relieve the symptoms we may have followed by a lifelong oral magnesium supplementation. So always the key message or take home message would be here. Um, always in refractory hypocalcemia, think magnesium first rather than anything else and uh, treat it. 
Thank you. Uh, so, Sain, what were your challenges in this case? So, we were giving magnesium at what dose and what is the problem in these cases? Sir, the problem initially was that uh, when we gave I, uh, IM magnesium, it rose immediately. But when we transferred to oral, it again fell. We actually had to give around 16 times the normal dose to this patient. Normal requirement may be 22. So, you need to give around 10 grams of magnesium every day. So, you, we were giving using a magnesium sulfate solution for the injection and breaking it and giving it. So it's a very, very difficult, challenging condition. They are not absorbing any magnesium. They are losing magnesium. So how do you maintain it? It becomes difficult. But now the child is doing pretty well in terms of seizure-free. We are able to cut down on the anti-epileptic drugs as well. So again, a big message. Think hypomagnesemia in that scenario. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashmi. Now, moving forward to the next case, a three-month girl, again symptomatic, again having seizures, and this time again, we have a low ionic calcium. The phosphorus here is low. So a low calcium and a low phosphorus. But the PTH is low. So uh, a low calcium and a low phosphorus with a low PTH, uh, I think uh, we can't uh, match this uh, case along with the diagnosis of the referral physician who labeled it as hypoparathyroidism. So Dr. Chisholm, do you think this is hypoparathyroidism? Thank you, Dr. Sayan, for this um, case. Again, a very interesting one. And yes, I understand why you would think it's um, hypoparathyroidism, but then again, there's a problem here. The phosphorus level is low and the PTH level is low. That's not in keeping with what is expected. Remember, in hypocalcemia, you expect the PTH level to go high, and conversely, when the calcium level is high, you expect the PTH level to come down. So at this point, um, okay, if, the, if there's hypocalcemia, if the PTH level is high, always consider the possibility of secondary hyperparathyroidism. So for the assessment of this child, everything is pointing or leaning towards a vitamin D deficiency. So when the vitamin D was assessed, what was the value, Dr. Sion? Yeah, the vitamin D was undetectable in this case. So that's very, very low. Clearly this child has a vitamin D deficiency, but remember, the phosphorus level is low. So why is the PTH value also low? I expect it to be high. So I requested for um, another PTH value and it turned out that it was actually high. So we discovered I mean, on further investigation that the serum that was acid or collected for PTH was improperly stored. It wasn't transported in ice. Remember, PTH is very thermolabile, very sensitive to heat. So if you must acid for PTH in any child, in any individual really, you must transport that blood on ice, otherwise you're going to get an aberrant result. So always remember in hypophosphatemia with hypocalcemia, it means that the PTH level is working. It can be low. Although if it's low, you may actually think it's hypoparathyroidism if the blood is properly transported on ice. So this is a take home message here. Always transport your serum on ice. And if you get a low phosphorus level with hypocalcemia, always uh, think, of uh, PTH level only when everything has checked out well. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chisholm, uh, that uh, this is the most important message. If not taking care of the pre-analytical uh, issues before uh, doing the investigations, we can have such confusing reports. So thank you. Uh, moving forward to the next case, we have a one week boy, seizures, low ionic calcium, very high phosphorus in this case. Creatinine now, as Dr. Anami, uh, Dr. Rashmi said in the next case, we did creatinine in this case. So CKD was ruled out. Low calcium, high phosphorus. So Dr. Anamika, what do you think in this case? Very early onset. Well, uh, this, this neonatal boy having hypocalcemic seizure with hyperphosphatemia as, and creatinine is normal, so already excludes chronic kidney disease. So next step is para, uh, measuring parathormone level. And what about the parathormone level? Yeah, PTH low, was so two. It's low. Yeah, it's it's low. So the child is having uh, hypoparathyroidism, and one of the important cause of neonatal hypoparathyroid uh, hypoparathyroidism is uh, Dijer syndrome. So when we get a patient with neonatal hypoparathyroidism, we should look for the important signs of this syndrome, like uh, cardiac defect, dysmorphic phases, especially cleft 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 palate, uh, immunodeficiency or uh, absent thymic shadow, although it's, uh, it, it may be absent in stress neonat also. Now, actually, this patient did have a cardiac defect. So diagnosis is, uh, as uh, the patient has already cardiac defect, so our uh, provisional diagnosis is Dejer syndrome, and it can be confirmed by a uh, fish study. Yeah. So key message is, 
Yeah. Hypocalcemia with high phosphate level indicates parathyroid defect. And if uh, when we get a patient with hypoparathyroidism, it's mandatory to evaluate cardiac function. Yeah. This patient, Cheyenne, comes to you with complaints of respiratory distress and you find that there is a pneumonia. What precautions will you take in this case? So, uh, respiratory distress can occur due to uh, low calcium and also... No, the he has pneumonia. Yeah. And you have admitted in the ICU. Yes. What should you do? Vibha? So I think we often tend to focus only on the endocrine aspect. So we actually had lost a case like this who have been managed outside with this scenario. So Dr. Anamika was mentioning about immunodeficiency. So you have to look at the total leukocyte count. The leukocyte count actually was, I think, nearly zero in that case. So in that scenario, you have to isolate them, role of IVIG. As you were discussing, Dr. Anamika, your inputs? Yeah. So, Dr. Anamika has already said that we should think of immunodeficiency in that scenario. Thank you, Dr. Anamika. Moving forward to the next case. This was a 10-year-old boy presented with seizures. Now, there was a low ionic calcium, but in spite of that, due to the seizures, the referral doctor went ahead with the CT. And this is what he found. And this is uh, what we have on presentation, a low ionic calcium and features of ectopic calcification. So Dr. Rashmi, can you take us forward from here? Any other thing that we have to think of in this case? Sure. It's a 10 year old boy. The scenario is with seizures and probably most probably hypocalcemic seizures. And uh, so in uh, along with hypocalcemia, if there's calcification, first thing maybe we have to think about is some parathormone uh, uh, re related uh, cause. So on clinical examination, this child also was found to have uh, cataract. Then uh, he was found to have brachymetacarpia and uh, subcutaneous calcinosis. So all these uh, features are uh, very much suggestive of, uh, uh, could I know the phosphorus level? Dr. Yeah, Sain? phosphorus was very high. Yeah, so high uh, this scenario with a high phosphorus level, a low calcium level definitely uh, looks like a parathormone defect unless we have uh, ruled out uh, CKD and here creatose 0.4. So definitely we have ruled out a uh, chronic kidney disease. And of course, parathormone was quite high. So despite the high parathormone uh, uh, with high phosphorus and low calcium, we should think of a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So yeah. This kind of clinical presentation, especially with intracranial calcification, always think of a parathormone defect. And uh, always look for other features suggestive of that, like brachymetacarpia and subcutaneous calcinosis. Yeah. Thank you. How will you manage this case? So, uh, we'll manage because PTH isn't acting. We'll manage with the final product. We'll give calcitriol and calcium. And what is the difference in terms of management of hypoparathyroidism and pseudo hypoparathyroidism? You can maintain a higher level of calcium in this case. So you have to maintain a higher level. In hypoparathyroidism, you have to be cautious because the urinary conservation is not there. So if their calcium goes beyond eight and a half, nine, you will have hypercalcemia. While here, because the PTH is acting in the conservation area, you can maintain a higher, you have to maintain a higher level, otherwise the bones will get resolved. So remember, in hypoparathyroidism, the target is around 8.5. In pseudo hypoparathyroidism, the target is around nine, nine and a half, and the treatment again is calcium and calcitriol. Uh, we have a four-week-old boy now. Seizures, ionic calcium again very low. Phosphorus in this uh, phosphorus now is very high. Low calcium, high phosphorus, normal creatinine. So, Dr. Rashmi, uh, kindly take us forward from here. Again, is this hypoparathyroidism? Uh, Dr. Rashmi. Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, is this uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism now? So immediately, four week old boy. Uh, it's a, a four week old boy, almost to the end of the neonatal period, and phosphorus is towards the upper limit of normal, but creat is normal, and uh, parathormone is significantly high. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, we may think of uh, uh, as I mean, right now we may think of uh, a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. We, we may have to think a uh, more uh, uh, common cause like uh, vitamin D levels. Ha was the vitamin D level done in this? Yeah, vitamin D levels were very low in this case. Yeah, uh, so in view of the uh, almost normal phosphorus levels and phosphate level and uh, low calcium, uh, yeah, vitamin D level is expected to be quite low and it, it was significantly low in this case. Yeah. And uh, But uh, 
Despite the secondary hyperparathyroidism here, calcium level is significantly low. So we may also have to think of a parathormone resistance here. Uh, because uh, uh, phosphorus level still remains on the higher side and uh, calcium level continues to be low despite the secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this is a combination of vitamin D deficiency with a likelihood of parathormone resistance. So the key uh, messages here would be uh, always check uh, vitamin D levels before diagnosing a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And uh, despite high parathormone levels, if the calcium is still low and uh, relatively high phosphorus, always think of a parathormone resistance. Yeah, a wonderful message by Dr. Rashmi. And this is what CERT always tells us PHP won't present this early. When a child presents this early, always think of secondary, uh, vitam uh, secondary PTH resistance due to vitamin D deficiency and always do a vitamin D before labeling a child with PHP. Moving Why forward. Why does vitamin D deficiency cause resistance, PTH resistance? So, uh, post cyclic AMP problems. Why? What is the concept behind it? So, because how much more will the uh, PTH uh, take so out from the bones? Basically, what is happening is no, no. So, basically, PTH is too much, but it is not able to convert to calcitriol. The major hypercalcemic effect of PTH is basically through the gut. But if it is not able to increase calcitriol, all everything is getting wasted. Mm -hmm. So, body says, okay, I will not allow further PTH action. So, long standing. Vitamin deficiency, particularly in infancy, but you reported also in that young child also, vitamin deficiency can cause hyperphosphatemia. So although the rule is that hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, normal creatinine, high pH equals PHP, you should consider vitamin D before that. That's a big message which Dr. Rashmi gave very clearly. Now, moving forward to the next case. Now we have a five-year-old child. Symptomatic, total calcium very low at 5.6. Phosphorus is very high. Creat was normal. So, Dr. Chisholm, is this case different from the previous one? Yes. Yes, Dr. Sayan, it's actually very different because if you look at the creatinine level, it's within normal. So, I would like to know what the PTH level is right now. And PTH the PTH was very level... Low. Yes, I can see that. So, this is indicative of um, hypoparathyroidism. So, at this point, I would like to start the child on calcium calcitriol. And was this child started on calcium calcitriol? Uh, I'll just add one thing. When this child presented to us, we also saw this. The child was uh, much more pigmented than his family members. And this was oh, actually wow. increasing over time. Oh, I understand. So um, I think at this point, I would like to point out that if you find a child that you suspect or you've confirmed to have hypoparathyroidism, it's very important to rule out cortisol deficiency, adrenal insufficiency, because that will be one of the most likely cause of hyperpigmentation in this child due to an increase in ACTH. So at this point, when you're given the child um, calcitriol and calcium, before you commence treatment, it's very important to rule out cortisol deficiency. So what was the... Now, now Dr. Chisholm, when this child was actually treated by the referral physician, uh, he gave him calcium and calcitriol. And, and when the this case? child was presented the to us, deficient in this child? Hello? Pardon? Yeah? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 When the calcium and calcium trial was started, so what, what was the response? Uh, when this child presented to us, he was very sick. And we, when we did the calcium levels, it was actually found to be high. Very high. Oh, interesting. So at this point, it's possible that we should do a, a serum electrolyte value. And what did we get after doing the yeah. serum electrolyte? There was actually salt wasting. And cortisol was very low, as you were mentioning. Exactly. So it's indicative of um, a likely disease called autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. Because in this disease, you have multiple endocrine um, abnormalities. In this case, we have hypoparathyroidism. There is adrenal insufficiency, which is in keeping with hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hyperpigmentation. So the key message here is that if you're suspecting hypoparathyroidism in a child, it has been confirmed, really. Always rule out autoimmune polyglandular syndrome because cortisol deficiency must have calcium. So if you start treatment without ruling out cortisol deficiency, you're going to end up with hypercalcemia. So it's very important in any child with hypoparathyroidism to always rule out cortisol deficiency before commencing treatment. Thank you very much. I think that's a very, very important message because the most common cause of for older children who present to us with hypoparathyroidism is actually APS. If you look at it, most of us between one to five years of age turn out to be APS. Beyond five, they look like more like idiopathic hypoparathyroidism. The other big message that Dr. Chizan gave is that if you have cortisol deficiency, 
it will basically cause hypercalcemia. So if you have reduced calcium requirement in the setting of hypoparathyroidism, if you have reduced ABP requirement in the setting of central DI, if you have reduced insulin requirement in the setting of type 1 diabetes, you should always exclude cortisol deficiency. Because cortisol deficiency causes hypercalcemia, it causes a SIADH-like picture, it causes a hypoglycemic picture. So cortisol deficiency should always be considered in this scenario and that becomes important in that regards. So we have discussed a lot about hypocalcemia. I'll go a bit about rickets because that's very important. And we all know that rickets is basically a disorder in which you have an effect of the growing plate. You have got cupping, praying, as well as playing. Now, all this is because of a problem of growth plate apoptosis. Your growth plate is not apoptosing and the agent which causes growth plate apoptosis is actually phosphorus. So everybody who has got rickets has a phosphorus deficiency. This is what you need to understand. Now, once you see rickets, you can then need to start treatment. Regarding treatment, there are various guidelines available. The global recommendations, these are from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. Remember, we are not talking about very, very high doses. We are typically talking about more like weekly doses at the maximum of 60,000 international units. No role of injections. The injections are only indicated if you think of malabsorption or if you think of celiac or something like that scenario. Very importantly, whenever you give vitamin D, give calcium because otherwise the bones will take all the calcium and the you will have hypocalcemia that is known as the hungry bone syndrome in that regards. Now, once you start treatment, remember calcium may go down, as I said, because bones are using the calcium now. ALP may go up because ALP is a marker of bone formation. You may have more bone pain because bone is being formed. So all these are not markers of inadequate response. So what is most important is the line of healing. So you have to show that the lining healing is there. If it's not there, it is a refractory rickets. So how do you define refractory rickets? Of course, you need to prove that this is a metaphysical involvement. You may have skeletal dysplasia, which looks like rickets, and you may confuse that, okay, this is refractory rickets. Adequate treatment, two courses or at least six to eight weeks of uh, vitamin D has been given, and there is no line of healing which is there. However, if a child is polyuric, has seizures, fractures, and severe growth failure right at the beginning of presentation, you may consider, okay, this may be a refractory rickets right in the regards. Very importantly, you may miss Diagnose refractory rickets if there is skeletal dysplasia, if you do not give enough calcium or vitamin D, or if the alkaline phosphatase levels go up and you say it is refractory rickets in that regard. Now, as I said, everybody with rickets is phosphopenic, low phosphorus. But broadly, we classify into ones because of deficiency of phosphorus, which are late presentation predominantly with lower limb involvement and normal parathyroid hormone levels. This is typically hypophosphatemic rickets or Fanconi syndrome. You can have problems of either the vitamin D, the entire axis are known as calcioponic rickets. Now in calcioponic rickets, also the phosphorus levels will be low because you have secondary hyperparathyroidism, early onset with tetany and hyperparathyroidism. Now you can have vitamin D deficiency, you can have calcium deficiency, you can have liver disease, anti-epileptics, kidney disease and VDDR. The most important investigation, therefore, in a child with rickets is phosphorus. If your phosphorus is high, you are dealing with either a kidney problem or you are dealing with a problem of pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, which may resemble right rickets in that regards. And finally, you can have acidosis, which is not really a disorder of the bone. It's basically eluting the bone and their RTA can be the cause. You will have failure to thrive, polyuria and nephrocalcinosis. So the investigations to do is phosphorus. If phosphorus is high, think of renal failure and PHP, urinary calcium. Everybody with rickets should have a low urinary calcium. If you have a high urinary calcium, you're dealing with renal tubular acidosis. PTH again should be high in everybody who has rickets. If it's normal, this is hypophosphatemic rickets. ALP should be high in most. If it's normal, think of RTA or chronic kidney disease if you have low alkaline phosphatase and rickets, that is a very rare scenario of hypophosphatasia. You will have 20, 30, that level of ALP. And acidosis, of course, will be there with RTA or chronic kidney disease. So the most important investigation is phosphorus. 
high phosphorus renal failure or php then calcium if it is low along with hyperparathyroidism you are not dealing with hypophosphatemic crickets so a low calcium or a high pth excludes hypophosphatemic crickets that will be a easier way to understand everybody else should have hypocalcemia or hyperparathyroidism hypercalciuria suggests a renal tubular acidosis and acidosis of course discussed about rta as well as renal failure so the key investigations are phosphorus calcium pth and ph these will give you the major picture plus you add urinary calcium so you look at the phosphorus if phosphorus is high most likely kidney disease rarely php otherwise give a adequate trial of calcium and vitamin d if there is no response and phosphorus is low blood gas will diagnose rta if calcium and pth are suggest are normal it is hypophosphatemic rickets otherwise they are vddr1 and 2 so phosphorus blood gas and pth these three will give you the diagnosis so we'll start there from their sign uh, thank you sir for your brief on rickets and moving ahead now we have a 3 year old boy presenting to us with rickets we had given him three doses of vitamin d weekly 60000 international units now the child presented to us after three weeks with complaining complaints of increasing bone pain now when we repeated the alp it had gone further high calcium came out to be normal and we were suspecting refractory rickets in this case uh, dr anamika do you agree that this is refractory rickets now uh, no dr sayan because we uh, just learned from the lecture of uh, olurak sir that bone pain and high alkaline phosphatase can be normally present during treatment of vitamin d so they are not a uh, gold standard uh, marker for the uh, response to therapy so to see the response to therapy we should go for uh, x ray of left wrist to find out the line of healing yes there is a present yeah, is there is a thick white line at the metaphyseal end of the long bone so there is a normal response to treatment so this is wrongly diagnosed as refractory yeah. and this is how sir also corrected me at that point of time and uh, so ha huh, anything else you want to mention do you need well uh, do you need any correction in this case because the child was also having deformities uh although a uh, bony deformity usually correct with treatment with vitamin d therapy if it's not happen or child is getting older in that case we can refer uh, to orthopedics for orthopedic correction yeah yeah thank you so much a uh, very so important key, point as you mentioned yeah now the key messages you want to deliver so key messages are uh, that is uh, um, line uh, sorry line of healing is the uh, best marker for uh, identifying the response to treatment and not confused with bone pain or increase alp uh, uh, as a marker of uh, uh, response to treatment actually thank you uh, thank you for this message dr anamika moving forward to the next case we have a 4 year old girl with rickets now i had given her uh adequate calcium 5 ml bd that comes out to be 500 mg per day but after recalling the child i found no improvement even after 30 days i repeated the x ray there was no line of healing so i thought of refractory rickets in this case so dr anamika do you think this is again a correct diagnosis or am i missing something well to identify refractory rickets we should uh, uh, focus on uh, treatment with adequate dose and duration of uh, treatment with vitamin d you, uh, you have on only given calcium and no vitamin d so uh, so first of all we have to give vitamin d in adequate dose and duration and according to the global recommendation the daily uh, dose of vitamin d is 2000 unit per day for infant and 3000 to 6000 Thousand units per day for uh, children, along with calcium supplementation, and the treatment should be given minimum three months. So we can say that the child is inadequately treated. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. identify, would you prefer parenteral vitamin D in this case? Sorry. Would you prefer any IV or uh, IM uh, vitamin D in this case? Well. Uh, there are different modalities of uh, treatment of rickets there is a weekly uh, therapy can be given but single dose or weekly therapy is uh, uh, discouraged to prevent vitamin d toxicity in that perspective uh, oral therapy is more encouraged 
Yeah, and so, uh, parenteral would be given only in case of malabsorption. And what do you in think case of malabsorption, yeah, in case of malabsorption, we can prescribe weekly IM therapy. In that case, the dose will be sixty thousand unit for six uh, six weeks, actually. Would you be considering Dr. Thayan calcitriol in this case? So calcitriol, I haven't treated him adequately. If the if the child had seizures, then mm. I would have thought of it. So the, you need to remember that the uh, analogs of vitamin D are very, very toxic because they have got a very high potency and a short half-life. They can cause hypercalcemia. The only role, as you said, is hypocalcemia. Otherwise, no role. So don't give all the preparations which contain calcitriol in this scenario. So the key messages, Dr. Anamika? So the key messages are uh, to diagnose refractory repairs. First of all, we should ensure completion of treatment with adequate dose and duration of vitamin D along with calcium for three months. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving ahead to the next case. Uh, now we have a four-year-old girl with rickets. Vitamin D, we had given her two courses, but there was no improvement of the same. Now... When we were suspecting refractory rickets in this patient, we also asked her about the associated symptoms. And in this case, the child had abdominal pain and anemia. So Dr. Rashmi, does this give any clue to other causes of rickets in this case? Yeah, this is a four-year-old child who has not responded to vitamin D, uh, to, uh, D courses, uh, of course, two complete courses. And uh, she also complains of abdominal pain and anemia. So... We, we may have to think about malabsorption syndromes here. And uh, since she has uh, abdominal pain, uh, probably we may have to think of conditions like uh, celiac disease. So in such cases, uh, uh, we may have to dig into the history further, asking for any other GI symptoms, look for growth failure and uh, look for uh, healing line on the X-ray. If uh, there is no healing line, then it is probably not responded to the uh, oral vitamin now, Dr. D. Dr. Rashmi, this patient so, was given parenteral vitamin D. So do you agree with this line of management? Dr. Rashmi? There seems to be a response to parenteral vitamin D, which will suggest that this was in fact malabsorption. So of course, uh, Dr. Rashmi was suggesting that we should get a TTG and other evaluation for celiac done. So it was strongly positive. So the key message would of course be that if you have anybody who has GI symptoms, anemia, think of celiac, evaluate again. Uh, moving ahead with the next case. Yeah, Dr. Rashmi. Yeah, uh, could you please, sir? Yeah, the, you can uh, give us the key messages in the previous case. Yeah. Moving ahead with the next, next case. Now, this was a five-year-old girl, had rickets, had complaints of polyuria along with. Weight and height was very low. Height age and weight age was around two years. Now, on uh, a VBG, she had metabolic acidosis and a urine pH, which was very inappropriate for the level of blood acid. Now, this was diagnosed to us as a case of RTA. Do you agree with this preliminary diagnosis, Dr. Chisholm, based on this report? Um, yeah, um, Dr. Sayan, before I can agree with that diagnosis, I would like to check the phosphorus level. Can you tell me what it is in this child? Yeah, the phosphorus level was 9. Okay. And what was the serum creatinine level? Uh, the serum creatinine was 2. Okay, so it's 2 milligram per DL of creatinine suggests chronic kidney disease. So I will walk along those lines, manage this child with chronic kidney disease. Again, like I mentioned earlier on, chronic kidney disease can give you a picture that is similar to um, hormonal uh, problems related to calcium metabolism, like re reduced PTH and whatnot. CKD in this case can give you metabolic acidosis. It can give um, hypocalcemia, high phosphorus levels. So address the CKD and then everything will work out fine. So the key message here is that for a child, with hypocalcemia, failure to thrive, um, high phosphorus level, particularly, always rule out chronic kidney disease because that will help save um, that child from doing a lot of unnecessary investigation. It will also save costs. So high phosphorus level with features suggestive of rickets, hypocalcemia, always think chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this wonderful message again that we have to look into the primary causes 
and not the secondary causes of tubul tubulopathy, as you very rightly pointed out in this case. Uh, moving ahead to the next case, we have a 12-year-old girl now. So later onset, having multiple fractures, but. Now on uh, asking her further, she said uh, her parents complained that she was having failure to thrive, polyuria okay. and myopathy and features suggestive of myopathy. So Dr. Anamika, any uh, special thoughts to this case? Well, uh, this girl, uh, we, we see from these two pictures that this girl has severe bony deformity as well as a uh, fracture in on X-ray. So uh, the line of investigation should be uh, calcium phosphate and alkaline phosphatase level. What about the phosphorus level? Yeah, phosphorus was 2.1 in this case. 2.1, which is <laughs> low and creatinine 0.6, that is normal. So it's exclude uh, uh, CKD. So next, uh, uh, as phosphorus is low, so next step is serum electrolyte and blood gas. The blood gas showed uh, metabolic acidosis, pH of 7.1. Yeah, metabolic acidosis. So our uh, we divert to uh, renal tubular acidosis. To differentiate between proximal and distal, I would like to do urinary pH. Yeah, so and the urinary pH. Yeah, it was 7.4. Yeah. So, uh, and... So metabolic acidosis with recurs and high urinary pH, all of these indicates this is a case of distal RTA, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the key messages now, Dr. Anamika? Uh, so key messages are uh, when you find a, a child with failure to try polyurea having recurs and fracture, consider a distal RTA one of the cause of recurs. And... Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay so th thank you for this wonderful message again. So later onset fractures, always think of distal RTA in a case of refractory rickets. Moving ahead to the next case. Now we have a 14 year old boy, again with refractory rickets. But in this case, we see a more lower limb involvement. So Dr. Ashmi, do you think uh, any other cause of the same predominant lower limb involvement, a later age of onset? Yeah, uh, this is a child with uh, quite old to have rickets. So probably the nutritional causes could be ruled out. And uh, he's got a predominant lower limb deformity with upper limbs almost paired. So the one thing we may have to think here is probably a low phosphorus, hypophosphatemia. So what was the way I would like to do the phosphate? Now, as you just said, the phosphorus came out to be very low. Yeah, according to this algorithm... Uh, in, uh, in cases of uh, hypophosphatemia, we may have, we may consider doing a blood gas subsequently. And yeah, blood, blood gas, gas is here. To be normal. Yeah, this was found to be normal. So uh, then we would like to do a calcium and a parathormone level. Uh, uh, this is so, the calcium, it was nine. And yeah, calcium is normal, parathormone is normal and uh, low phosphorus. Yeah. So it's a classical hypophosphatemic rickets with late onset and uh, predominantly involving the lobal limbs. Yeah. Um, so the so, diagnosis, the, yeah. so the take home messages would be whenever there is normal parathormone levels, normal calcium levels, and predominantly lower limb involvement and late onset, always think of a hypophosphatemic rickets and, uh, uh, so treat accordingly. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful message again, Ki, uh, if there is only low phosphorus with normal PTH and normal calcium, we always have to consider hypophosphatemic rickets. So now we'll go to the final aspect of hypercalcemia. Now hypercalcemia should be suspected, especially in units with a sick scenario, if you have severe dehydration, polyuria, and hypotonia and encephalopathy. So any sick child, check calcium. That is a big message. And in children, again, with abdominal pain, uncontrolled hypertension, and if you have calcification at any point of time, or of course, if you have metabolic bone disease. Now, hypercalcemia theoretically can be because of two disorders. As we discussed, either if your bone turnover is more because of hyperparathyroidism primarily, or you have increased absorption that is large because of vitamin D related causes. So, if you have hyperparathyroidism, typically your phosphorus will come down. If you have a vitamin D related cause, your phosphorus will be high. So, again, phosphorus is a key investigation to look at. You can rarely have decreased excretion, which is not very common. Calcium sensing receptor defect, which is causing an inactivating mutation, will have a scenario in which you have hypercalcemia 
with hypocalciuria. So phosphorus and urinary calcium will give you a diagnosis and hyperparathyroidism is classically the most common cause to look at in this group. While if you have uh, other thing very important to remember is a lytic uh -huh. lesion. So in children, if you have acute <laughs> lymphoblastic yeah. leukemia, you can also have hypercalcemia, which may happen. If there is immobilization also, you will have less amount of bone turnover as also happens with hypophosphatasia. So if your alkaline phosphatase is less, you are not using your phosphorus. You will have in that scenario, hypocalcemia will happen. If your vitamin D absorption is increased and if you have increased uptake, you will have a similar scenario. Now, if you are in that scenario, your 1-alpha hydroxylase will be low. If there are granulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, as well as a fatty necrosis, you can have increased expression of 1-alpha hydroxylase that also causes hypercalcemia in that Regard. So, these are the conditions you should think of in that regard. So, I will say mainly think of hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D excess, that is very important, granulomatous disease, and a calcium sensing receptor defect. So, what you have to look at is phosphorus. If phosphorus is high, this is PTH independent, as I discussed. And of course, PTH in somebody who has hypercalcemia, PTH should actually be low. If your PTH is about 20, that is high. So this is inappropriately high. You start thinking of a hyperparathyroidism. Urinary calcium, everybody with hypercalcemia should have hypercalciuria. But if your urinary calcium is low, this is a calcium sensing receptor defect. And again, vitamin D will also give you a clue. If it's very high, it is vitamin D excess and calcitriol in that scenario. As discussed, I don't know, so I have calcemia. Your PTH should be less than 20 if the PTH Ali, oppo ave, oppo A57 uh, Himan, can you mute it, please? So if you if you have hypercalcemia, your PTH should be less than 20. If your PTH is more than 20, it is the history of hyperparathyroidism. So approach is if PTH level is below 20, look at vitamin D. If it is high, this is vitamin D excess. If it is normal, you look at calcitriol. If calcitriol is high, it is granulomatous disease. If it's normal, this is hypophosphatasia. If the PTH level is above 20, so even if it's normal, you look at fractional excretion of calcium. If it's high, this is hyperparathyroidism. It is less, it is calcium sensing receptor defect. So essentially, the main message is to look at phosphorus levels. And then based upon that, you look at vitamin D level, which will give you a diagnosis hyperparathyroidism do a urinary calcium which will give you a, a clue. So, sign you can now carry with power with the calcium issues. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, moving forward to the next case uh, on hypercalcemia. So, this was a 12-day-old girl presenting to us with irritability. She was very dehydrated. Now, just look at the calcium levels. Calcium was 18 in this case. Dr. Rashmi, what do you, do you think of a girl presenting so early with such a high calcium level? Yeah, this is a newborn baby uh, with uh, severe hypercalcemia. So uh, we must think of uh, uh, most commonly genetic defects here. And she has uh, uh, very well presented with dehydration because polyuria is one of the manifestations. So uh, I would like to do a parathormone level in the first place. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was one twenty. Yeah, it was found to be sky high actually. It's yeah. quite elevated. And uh, so, uh, next thing would be uh, to do a, a urinary calcium, as uh, Brax very clearly mentioned. Yeah. So, a uh, urinary mm -hmm. calcium creatinine ratio of 0.3 is uh, uh, reasonably okay. That is, I mean, there is no hypercalciuria at least. So, if it is a, a uh, like in hyperparathyroidism, if there is hypercalcemia, as sir mentioned, there should be hypercalciuria also. But here, uh, calcium excretion in the urine is almost normal. So this must be something to do with the calcium uh, sensing receptor uh, defect. So uh, th the thing is, uh, it's not sensing. It it's uh, assuming that the calcium levels are normal. So urine, I mean, calcium is not excreted in the urine. So it's it this causes uh, severe neonatal hyperparathyroidism. And uh, which is an acute emergency, in fact. It has to be addressed immediately, uh, surgically, probably. Otherwise, uh, we are going to lose the baby. Yes. Uh, so the uh, take-home messages uh, would be whenever we uh, generally always think of hypocalcemia in a newborn baby. 
and we generally never consider hypercalcemia. So whenever there is a polyuria, irritability, dehydration, seizures, encephalopathy, always think hypercalcemia. And in this, a very young age presentation like this would be always would prompt us to think about a genetic defect, especially the calcium receptor. Uh, I mean, the sensing defect of the calcium receptor. Yeah. So thank you, yeah, thank you, Dr. Rashmi, for this wonderful message. So we can also consider you uh, um, uh, blood investigation in the parents also. Yes. Yeah. So that will give you. A... Yeah. yeah. So moving forward to the next case, we have a two-year-old girl now with complaints of abdominal pain. Now, the ultrasound was done due to abdominal pain, showed nephrocalcinosis. Calcium was then done. Calcium came out to be high, 13.6. Now, the phosphorus here is also high. So, Dr. Chisholm, is this a PTH problem? Dr. Chisholm? This is a scenario in Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for that um, presentation. So I would like to point out quickly that this is like a reverse of what we've been doing so far. This is a child with hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia. So it inevitably means that the PTH level is appropriately low. Otherwise, you would have been thinking that there's a problem with the PTH. So at this point, the PTH level, what was it in this child? The PTH was undetectable in this case. So that's what it should be. It should be low in a situation of um, hypercalcemia. At this point, I would like to check the vitamin D. What yeah. was it? Yeah, the vitamin D was very high at 200. Yes. Yeah, that goes without saying. This vitamin D level is so, so high. And at this point, I'd like to make a diagnosis of vitamin D toxicity. So at this point, I would like to point out that in a situation of hypercalcemia, remember, in hypercalcemia, the pH level should be low. And the one way of noticing this is that the phosphorus level should also be high. And that was what was in keeping here. So the next thing that we should do is to check for any vitamin D excess. So in this um, case, the vitamin D was equally high, giving room for vitamin D toxicity. So at this point, I would like to cancel the mother to stop um, intake, giving this child vitamin D. I would also like to point out that the key message here is, is to always remember that once there's hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, always think of a problem with vitamin D. In this case, an excess, it can be PTH problem. It's unlikely to be. So for the hypercalcemia, hydration with um, frisamide to enhance excretion, and of course, steroid treatment is necessary here to achieve normal calcium level. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this wonderful explanation. Again, which sir also mentioned, high calcium, high phosphorus, think vitamin D. High calcium, low phosphorus, think of PTH problems. Moving forward to the next case, we have a 15-day girl, preterm, 28 weeks of gestation. Calcium, again, very high at 14. Now, you check the phosphorus here. It came out to be pretty low for this gestational age. PTH, we did, considering the primary PTH problem. It was here undetectable. So, Dr. Anamika, any other cause of this? Could you please guide us here? Well, this uh, preterm baby having hypercalcemia with hypophosphatemia and parathyroid is also low. So my next uh, step of investigation is vitamin D level. What about the 25D or calcitriol level? Yeah, 25 well, uh, hydroxy vitamin D was 20 nanograms per ml. Yeah, it's a lower end and calcitriol 125 is a higher yeah. end. Is yeah. there any history of taking uh, total parenteral nutrition? Yeah, the child is very sick and on TPN. Okay, it's a common uh, scenario of a preterm baby having uh, TPN, uh, uh, having this low phosphorus level due to decreased supplementation of phosphorus. And this low phosphorus level increase one alpha hydroxylase ac action, which increases calcitriol production, ultimately increasing hypercalcemia. So that this baby having hypophosphatemia. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, kindly go, go ahead with your key messages. And key message are hypercalcemia with very low parathyroid level exclude hyperparathyroidism and hypophosphatemia can be itself a cause of hypercalcemia. Yeah, uh, due to high calcitriol as you just mentioned and this case uh, very well demonstrate this case that the actual cause of hypercalcemia is low phosphorus due to TPN as you wonderfully mentioned Dr. Anamika. Uh, thank you. Uh, moving forward to the next case. Now we have a two-month-old boy presenting to us with fractures. Calcium, again, very high at 14 milligrams per deciliter. Phosphorus at 6.8. PTH here is undetectable. 
So, Dr. Anamika, any other thing that you would like to consider in this case? Well, this uh, boy having high, high calcium and high phosphate with low parathyroid level. So, uh, again, next step is uh, measuring vitamin D level. Yeah. And vitamin D both are uh, low. So, yeah. as uh, vitamin D also low. So, uh, my here my provisional, uh, sorry, sorry my, my diagnosis, it may be a disorder of bone turnover as patient has already high calcium and high phosphate, high phosphate. And so uh, also did an ALP, it was 24. Yes. So next to uh, diagnose the disorder of bone turnover, my next step will be alkaline phosphatase level measurement. And as it's low, so it indicates it's a uh, case of hypophosphatasia. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what are the key messages? So that you'd like key to messages do? are uh, uh, high calcium and high phosphate indicates low bone turnover, and uh, and low uh, along with low cal alkaline phosphatase level indicates hypophosphatasia. Yeah. So again, a wonderful message of contrasting from the previous case of vitamin D excess. After ruling out vitamin D excess, always do a ALP because as uh, this case shows. Hypophosphatasia can also present with similar complaints. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Anamika. Moving ahead with the next case. Now we have a four-day-old boy presenting to us with seizures. Now this child had a history of asphyxia. Calcium very high at 18 milligrams per deciliter. Phosphate doing fine. PTH we did was undetectable. So Dr. Rashmi, does asphyxia signify anything in this case? Yeah, uh, the background of asphyxia in a newborn baby uh, with uh, uh, significantly elevated calcium and uh, relatively lower phosphorus and uh, almost a negligible uh, parathormone. So, looks like a, a parathormone independent cause of uh, hypercalcemia. Yeah. So, uh, we would like to do uh, next would be a vitamin D level, which was found to be normal. So, according to the algorithm, next would be to do a calcitriol, which so was, calcitriol was very high. Yeah, significantly high. So uh, maybe we may have to examine the baby to look for any other clues. Now there was multiple uh, violet, violet nodules in this patient. Yeah, maybe that may uh, suggest fat necrosis uh, uh, because uh, uh, this calcitriol high, it could be uh, a granulomatous problem. Uh, when there is a palpable nodule, violaceous, tender skin nodules in the newborn baby with a very high calcitriol uh, levels, uh, we have to think of fat necrosis. So this may be a most likely cause of hypercalcemia in this baby. Yeah. So the key messages would be uh, always consider fat necrosis with nodules and with high calcium in a newborn baby with a background of asphyxia because it's relatively common and we may have to look for that. And the treatment would be uh, to give proper hydration, steroid and uh, diuretics like Lasix. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashmi, for this wonderful message again. Uh, so you. moving forward to the next case, uh, this is a three-year-old boy presenting to us with complaints of bone pain. Calcium was done very high at 14.4. Phosphorus doing fine again. Again, PTH is undetectable. Now, vitamin D of cal and calcium, as the uh, protocol shows us, these were again normal. So, Dr. Chisholm, any other cause of this we can think of apart from the vitamin D dependent and the hypophosphatasia that can cause the same? Yes, there's something uh, that I would like to think of. But then again, I want to draw the viewer's attention to a particular issue here. This is a child with hypercalcemia. And um, ideally, you expect the phosphorus level to be high, but it's low. So at this point, what can it be? So the PTH level is equally low as well. The vitamin D level also low. Cast to trial within normal range. So what can it be? At this point, I'd like to do an x-ray of this child. And um, it indicated that there were lytic lesions in the bone. And what was the alkaline phosphatase level, Dr. Sion? Yeah, it was very high. It was very high. Well, at this point, I'd like to do a bone marrow aspiration because remember, apart from the hormonal issues that we know that is associated with calcium metabolism, it's very important to rule out other sources as well. So a bone marrow aspiration, what was the result? Uh, the bone marrow aspirate showed a huge number of atypical leukocytes. 
so suggestive of um, acute or lymphoblastic leukemia. Yeah. It's very important for us to understand that there's some malignancies, in this case, ALL, I'm going to work with that, that can actually cause an invasion of the bone. So when there's an invasion of the bone with malignant cells, it increases osteoclastic activity, and that can lead to hypercalcemia. So when you assess this child, done several investigations, and it's not telling with what is um, expected, there's low PTH, there's low vitamin D, calcitriol, similarly within normal level, always think outside the box, always examine, um, think of the possibility of leukemia. And in this case, uh, this child actually had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So that is my take home message. Think outside the box when it doesn't fall into place. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Chisholm, for this wonderful discussion. And we are now uh, discussed exhaustively over the last 20 cases of calcium. In this one hour, so we were able to cover the entirety of it. I'd like to thank Dr. Anamika, Dr. Rashmi, and Dr. Chisholm, along with Dr. Sayan, for making it uh, really interactive and completing all those aspects. We'll take a few questions which are there. So there is a question from Dr. Rajiv Das, who says that uh, in nutritional record, seven-year-old with bony deformity, what will be the duration and dose of vitamin D and calcium? So the initial one will be to correct it. So this may be required for up to three months. So this can be done as a daily dose, or you can do a weekly dose. After that, we would like to look at the bone of healing, whether that's there or not. And the second would be to look at continuation with a maintenance dose of calcium as well. Dr. Gayatri is asking weekly vitamin D or daily vitamin D. So vitamin D daily is, of course, better, but then the issues of adherence may be there. So in that case, you can think of a weekly therapy, but preferable will be a daily dose. Dr. Karthik is asking for prevention of rickets. Do we need to give calcium supplement or vitamin D alone? Usually, calcium deficiency is not that important, especially in younger age group. So vitamin D alone may be good enough, especially in breastfed individuals. Dr. Bharani is asking, this could be hypophosphatase as condition also cause fracture tendency. Um, yes, we have to consider that as a possibility as well in that scenario. So if you have high calcium, high phosphorus fractures, low bone mass, think of hypophosphatase as a possibility. So we have really gone through extensively with regards to the various uh, aspects of uh, the calcium disorder. I'll again thank Dr. Chisholm, Dr. Rashmi, Dr. Anamika and Dr. Sayan for the wonderful discussion. We'll move forward now to the second session of today, which is very, very relevant and very important from the ICU perspective, in which we'll be talking about the electrolyte disorders. And we know that electrolyte disorders can cause a lot of confusion in terms of evaluation and management. We will uh, be joined by uh, a galaxy of experts from across the country who will be participating in this program. And uh, for this session, we have got uh, Dr. Sumana, who is uh, from the Vivekanand Institute of Medical Sciences, Kolkata. Dr. Kamlesh Agarwal, who is from uh, J.K. Lone Hospital, Jaipur. Dr. Vidhu Ashok, who is uh, uh, from uh, Malabar Medical College, Calicut. And Dr. Pragya Somani from Bhilwada. And all of them have been actively involved in terms of uh, our programs as well as uh, the other participation which is there. I'll also be joined by Dr. Vibha, who will be moderating the session after we had the initial discussion in that regard. So when we talk about electrolyte disorder, we need to remember that both sodium and potassium play a very important role in electrolyte regulation. And when we talk about tonicity, the sodium is a major regulator of the tonicity while water will depend upon the volume. So when we talk about the sodium level, we have to look at how much sodium is there and how much free water is there. Most disorders of sodium are actually because of free water. If you have too much free water, you have hyponatremia. If you have too little free water, you will have hypernatremia. And this is regulated at the level of thirst and urine output. Now, this basically regulates using the water intake and how much water you are losing. Now, in conditions where your tone increases, the body will then start to have stimulation of the secretion of vasopressin because that will be sensed by the osmoreceptor and this vasopressin will then cause conservation of water, free water, and this will restore the status. So AVP is a highly sensitive hormone which works at a very 1% change. You will have a modification which are there in that perspective. However, if your volume goes down, the major regulator there is the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, which will then cause our absorption of sodium in competition to potassium. So RAS basically causes high sodium and low potassium. So if you have a RAS deficiency, 
like any form of hypoaldosteronism pseudo hypoaldosteronism adrenal insufficiency you will have hyponatremia with hyperkalemia that's a predominant finding that you will find on that however if your volume becomes too much the atrial natriuretic peptide comes into the picture and that will cause a loss of sodium and therefore anybody who has a long standing hyperaldosteronism will not have hyponatremia main presentation will be hypokalemia and alkalosis in that perspective that becomes important now potassium is not only in the extracellular fluid predominantly it is in the cell so conditions which cause exchange of potassium with the intracellular homeostasis can cause a hypokalemic picture particularly with hyperinsulinism that we will discuss in treatment of dka along with the use of beta agonist in that regards now serum sodium when we are assessing it should ideally can be done any time of the day but remember that if somebody had seizures you will have lot of muscular activity and the sodium may falsely go up so you have to be careful don't use that particular arm very importantly if you have a hyperproteinemia hyperglycemia or hyperlipidemia you will have pseudo hyponatremia now in hyperglycemia this will persist even if you are using a ion selective electrode because it is not pseudo in the truest sense it is dragging more water out you will have high levels if the albumin level is on the lower side in that regards normal sodium is 135 to 145 and if it's less than 130 we consider worried about hypo and if it's more than 150 about hypernatremia now potassium is typically a intracellular ion again you can do any time of the day but remember don't use a hemolytic sample so don't squeeze it and avoid using syringe definitely tourniquet should actually be avoided in that perspective and don't keep it for a long time because then the rbcs will lyse and they will increase the potassium level in that regards you may have pseudo hyperkalemia if there is hemolysis or if you have a high count like leukemia they will all consume the potassium and you may have falsely low level of potassium so all this becomes important in terms of evaluation the blood gas as discussed is not a very reliable marker it will typically lower by 0.4 millimoles compared to the serum sample that we are using in that regards so be cautious about tourniquet squeeze sample and high cell count in that regards now this is very interesting normally we talk about this interplay we said calcium and phosphorus we said if calcium goes up phosphorus should go down if calcium goes down phosphorus should go up similarly when we talk about sodium and potassium generally if the sodium goes up like aldosterone is high potassium should come down when sodium comes down potassium should go up but if you have hypernatremia with hypokalemia this is a typical scenario this is a ras excess now as i said the sodium excess is not going to be huge because atrial natriuretic peptide will come into the picture and it will wash off the sodium if you have hyponatremia you will have hyperkalemia this is typically a scenario of a ras defect this is pseudo hypoaldosteronism hypoaldosteronism adrenal insufficiency all those phenomena will be there but if you have a rare situation of high sodium high potassium only one condition remember is gordon syndrome real scenario if you have low sodium low potassium you are losing it either by the gut so you have diarrhea or by the kidney because of tubulopathy or diuretic use so if you want to really look at the sodium potassium together you will get a lot of information in that perspective so hyponatremia can usually be because of excess free water in that scenario the individual will be you or hypervolemic and uric acid will be low now uric acid excretion depends upon the amount of water in the body if you have more water more uric acid excretion less uric acid so uric acid is a good marker of hydration if you have a sodium loss on the other hand you will be hypovolemic with high uric acid now excess free water can be because of overload you will have edema cardiac renal all those causes will be there and you will have a low urinary sodium or if there is a reduced loss of free water typically because of si adh you will have a situation in which the urinary sodium will be high now remember si adh like picture can also be caused by cortisol deficiency and hypothyroidism so si adh is a diagnosis of exclusion don't rush anybody with uvolemic hyponatremia don't call them si adh you have to look at other possibilities now if you talk about sodium loss it can be extra renal 
In that scenario, the body will conserve the urinary sodium or it could be renal where your urinary sodium will be high. A scenario could be again with tubulopathy like diuretic use or other scenario versus RAS defect. To differentiate this, you will have hypokalemia in this scenario and you will have hyperkalemia in RAS defect. So basically, if you look at the key things, fluid status, the potassium status, and urinary sodium, you will know entirely everything about hyponatremia etiology. So if uric acid is low, which means you have fluid overload, it is either SIADH or fluid overload. If you have a low urinary sodium, it means it's a extra renal cause, which you have to worry about. If the potassium is high with hyponatremia, you are dealing with a RAS defect or renal failure. And if hemoglobin again is a marker of volume status. So if you look at these parameters, you will make a correct diagnosis. So to approach hyponatremia, first rule out hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperproteinemia and renal failure. Then look at volume. If volume is more, this is fluid overload. If volume is normal, look at thyroid and cortisol. If that is normal, this is SIADH. If there is hypervolemia, look at urinary sodium. If the urinary sodium is low, this is extra renal loss like GI loss, cystic fibrosis. If it's more, look at potassium. You have hypokalemia. This is tubulopathy or diuretic use. If you have high level, this is a RAS defect. So first look at volume. If volume is euvolemic, look at thyroid and cortisol. If volume is low, look at urinary sodium and potassium. You will basically get the diagnosis pretty much in that scenario. So we will start off with the uh, cases then. So, uh, so basically, as we have discussed, the main scenario to look at in this situation is to look at the urinary sodium and other parameters. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Vibha to come up and she will be presenting the first case, which is going to flow. And we'll start off discussing the cases initially about the uh, scenarios of predominantly in the setting of uh, hyponatremia first. So while we are setting up the situation, so hyponatremia as discussed, the predominant situations from an endocrine perspective is we need to really consider a possibility of a salt wasting form, which becomes very, very important in that perspective to evaluate. And then we need to consider about the other possibilities, especially about SIADH, in which you will have cortisol deficiency. The often confusion which is there in this scenario is whether if you have a cortisol deficiency, you will always have hyperkalemia. That is not true because if you have isolated cortisol deficiency, which is because of ACTH deficiency, you will only have hyponatremia, but no hyperkalemia. So we will now start with the first case in this scenario. And uh, so Dr. Vibha, you can start off now. Thank you, sir. So we have a 20-year-old boy who was admitted in 12 with decay and uh, his blood sugar was 700 <laughs> and uh, his uh, sodium was 126 which is uh, hyponatremia and uh, potassium was 3.6 and the blood gas shows uh, acidosis. So Dr. Kamlesh, what should be done? Uh, we should uh, uh, correct the hyponatremia in this case? No. Thank you, Dr. Viva. Actually, we have to first uh, rule out whether it is true hyponatremia or it is pseudo hyponatremia. As uh, Dr. Androx has already told us that uh, pseudo hyponatremia can be caused by either increased lipid level in the blood or increased protein level or increase in the glucose level. And uh, ion selectors cannot uh, identify that uh, uh, hyper hyponatremia due to uh, hyperglycemia. As in our case, we have a child who have blood sugar is 700 milligram per dl which is very quite high. So we have to calculate the corrected sodium 
level and uh, for as we know that every 100 mg rise in the blood sugar level above 100 mg per dl in uh, there will be fall in the serum sodium level of 1.6 so we have to calculate the serum sodium level of 1.6 into uh, 6 uh, 120 uh, 126 so it will uh, then it will be 135.6 so so uh, the corrected sodium co concentration will be 135.6 that is normal for the uh, uh, for for this child, right, sir. So, what key message would you like to give from this case? So, the key message is that uh, before starting any treatment in a hyponatremia, we have to first correct uh, calculate the corrected sodium level. Whether it is too hyponatremic, pseudo hyponatremic, we have to rule out. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Very rightly said by the sir. We should not rush to the diagnosis of hyponatremia in cases of high blood sugar. We should get the corrected sodium done first. So now moving towards the next case, we have this one week old boy uh, with the low sodium that was 128 and uh, with the lower side of the potassium 3.6. So Dr. Subana, how uh, should we you. move in this case? Thank you, Dr. Bimba. Um, an interesting scenario. So as we just learned, we should always look at the fluid status of the baby uh, right. to make a diagnosis. So I would like to ask, is the baby hypovolemic or dehydrated or uh, when you just... Oh. Ma'am, there was no dehydration, but the hydration was well maintained. All right. So there's no dehydration. So I would assume that it's a case of euvolemic hyponatremia. As we have learned, again, as per the protocol, we should always look for... Okay, cortisol and uh, thyroxine, but you, you have already given me a, a sugar value of 24. That's antitotic hypoglycemia picture we can see here. So I would really like to know the cortisol level in this case, please. Ma'am, when we got the cortisol level, it was uh, 125. So what do you think? This cortisol uh, level is going with this sodium level? No, that, this is very important actually. So uh, the, this cortisol level is actually inappropriately low for this level of hypoglycemia and hyponatremia. This is a very important point that we should always note and so interpret the results accordingly in the light of the other results. And I can also see you've given that the growth hormone uh, level is also four. So right. I can see there are two already, uh, you know, hormonal deficiencies we can already gather there. Um, and you've already given me a photo. Um, there is also in the picture, micropenis is also there. Yes, so that kind of completes the diagnosis. So, so important to look at the baby clinically and also look at the biochemicals and interpret them properly. So, in this care, baby with the micropenase and hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, with, uh, you know, uh, low, inappropriately low cortisol and growth hormone, I think it's a case of hypopituitarism, panhypopituitarism. Uh, so, very interesting case, actually. And I would really like uh, the listeners to note that, uh, you know, we often get such cases of hyponatremia in babies and instead of overlooking that or not exploring that we should always send especially in case of you volumic case like in this one we should always send for cortisol levels and thyroxine and also interpret the levels cortisol levels in the light of the other report. so for this level of hypoglycemia and hyponatremia this cortisol is definitely low and should not be considered as normal so ma'am, what Thank you. message would you like to give? Yeah, so as I said, in all cases of euvolemic hyponatremia, so we know that the child is not dehydrated, there is no vomiting, diarrhea, nothing else going on. Uh, so cortisol levels should always be sent here. And cortisol levels below 550 nanomoles per liter should be considered as low. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. As ma'am have already mentioned that... Uh, uh, the volume status is very important in case of hyponatremia and they give us a clue in which direction we are moving towards. And especially, so, especially I would also like to say that the implication of such a diagnosis, you see MPHD, isn't it a lifelong right. diagnosis and this should be, this can be made at such an early stage. So it's very important. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So moving towards the next case, uh, we have this 14-year-old boy who was brought to the hospital because he was having some drowsiness and we get the sodium level done it was quite low it was 116 only when we examined the baby the hydration status was good uh, the hydration was well maintained we, when the urinary sodium was done it was 100 and the urinary uh, osmolality was 300 so uh, the diagnosis of sidh was made in the emergency and fluid restriction was done so dr vidu 
uh, what do you think? Uh, are you satisfied with this diagnosis of SIDA? And uh, is this future restriction is judicious in this case? First, I would like to thank for the uh, Anurag sir for the special opportunity and Dr. Viba for uh, moderating our cases. So now we have come with a boy who, ha who has drowsiness, whom we have noted to have hyponatremia. And uh, we can see that he's uvolumic. And we can see that the urinary sodium is also low. So it's like we are thinking in terms of SIADH, but sir has well explained that SIADH is always a diagnosis of exclusion. So before tagging the patient, we have to ideally check the cortisol status. It's like an extension of the case which I've already discussed. So it's like we have to check the cortisol and also the thyroid status of the patient, free T4 and TSH. And, right. oh yeah, okay. So, uh, so the values. Uh, yeah, when we get the thyroxine cortisol level done, the PT4 okay. was two and the cortisol was quite low. It was 120 only. So again, this is another case, like uh, there is multiple uh, pituitary hormone deficiency. Uh, like the before case, even in this case, what we have to understand is that SIDH is a case, it's a very, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So before tagging or doing fluid restriction, we have to look into when it is uvolumic, you we have to look into the cortisol levels as well as the uh, thyroid status. So that is almost like the key message for this uh, question. Okay. So, yeah. okay. so the key messages mom have already given that the uh, SIDH is a diagnosis of exclusion and uh, we have to always uh, uh, get the cortisol and free T4 level done in the patient of uvolumic and hyponatremia. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now you. moving towards the next case. We have a three-week-old uh, child and uh, he came to us for the failure, of failure to thrive. Uh, when the sodium level was done, it was 110 only. And uh, he has only gained 100 gram in three weeks. Uh, was severely dehydrated. Hematocrit was 62. Urine sodium was 100. And potassium, hyperkalemia. There was 8.4 potassium was there. So, Dr. Pragya. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Dr. Pragya. Okay. Yeah. So, ma'am, can, uh, can you uh, hear How me? should we proceed this case? So, as we can see uh, in this case, uh, it's it's a hypovolemic child. No? Right. PC is raised. So, this is a hypovolemic child with a urine sodium which is on higher side right. and, uh, and there is hyperkalemia. So, this would uh, point toward a RAS defect. And ma'am, when we examined the child, uh, okay. there was atypical genitalia. Yeah, so uh, so these atypical genitalia point toward a, towards a defect in uh, the steroidogenic pathway, most likely. Did we uh, did we get seventeen OHP done in yes, this? Yes, ma'am. We sent the seventeen OHP test, and it was two hundred. So so this is a raised seven uh, seventeen OHP. This seems to be a classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which right. is a result of the salt wasting type. Uh, which is resulting in these symptoms. Right, ma'am. So, ma'am, what key message would you like to give? So, the key message is that uh, in hyponatremia with hyperkalemia, a RAS defect should be considered. And in case of atypical genitalia, in case we see atypical genitalia, this points towards a CAH. But in males, as there will be no features in males at birth or at the three weeks of age, so we, we have to be more cautious in males. We should not overlook these symptoms of hyponatremia and hyperkalemia as, as this can be a life-threatening situation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now moving towards the next case, we have this six-month-old girl uh, who was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis as she was uh, uh, not gaining weight and uh, she was having the recurrent chest infections. Uh, when the sodium, uh, the, sorry, sweat chloride test was done, it was uh, 120 and there was no history of statoria. Uh, her sodium level was 120 and there was hyperkalemia. So, Dr. Kamlesh, uh, what do you think is the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis? Are you satisfied with this diagnosis or no, are no, you? No, uh, no, I am not satisfied with this. Yeah, yeah. In cystic, uh, we are not satisfied with the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis because 
as we know in the cystic fibrosis there is uh, the electrolyte uh, abnormality is hypokalemia and hyper uh, hyponatremia with metabolic alkalosis and this child has no stratory also so we have to look for the uh, as the child has hyponatremia with hyperkalemia we have to look for the uh, ras serum uh, sodium serum pot ml uh, serum so urinary sodium level and urinary sodium level is more than 120 millimoles per liter then it indicates the ras defect and we have to look for the uh, plasma renin activity and aldosterone level and yes, if sir. they are high along with hyponatremia and hyperkalemia then we uh, with recurrent chest infections we have to think about the pseudo hypoaldosterone type yes sir we did the urine sodium in this case and it was 120 and both the renin and aldosterone level was high so biba why did this child have respiratory infections so because this uh, uh, because as we know there is a resistance to the this inex uh, channel there is a defect in the inex channel in the pseudo hypoaldosterone this uh, inex channels are also present in this uh, sweat gland so this uh, no sir this is inex channel also present in this bronchial alveolar that's why they are more prone to have respiratory infection and this is a very difficult scenario we have had a girl who required multiple admissions because their secretions are very very concentrated and that's why they are not able to expel so whenever they have a infection their infection tends to be more severe so this is often misdiagnosed as cf but even if you are diagnosed as pseudo hypoaldosteronism you have to be very cautious in this scenario because they will develop this blockage of secretion yes. because of like dr kamlesh yeah, yes yes Hello. Sir, what three messages would you like to give? So we have to uh, always any child who has presented recurrent chest infections along with hyponatremia and hyperkalemia or salt washing, we have to think about about the pseudo hypoaldosterone. Right, sir. So any patient who is having uh, this salt wasting and recurrent pneumonia, it is not cystic fibrosis. We have to keep in mind that it could be pseudo hypoaldosterone, as sir has rightly said. Thank you so much, sir. now moving towards the next case we have this uh, one month old boy who came to us because there was a refusal to feed and uh, this boy has gained only 100 kg in this one 100 gram sorry in this one month and uh, uh, they showed that uh, the blood uh, sodium level was 124 and there was hyperkalemia Uh, so in the view of this uh, the boy is not taking feed and uh, there was lethargy the salt wasting like symptoms also so we get the 17 ohp level done it was normal and cortisol was high so and we get the aldosterone level all done which was on the higher side and pra was also on the higher side so dr sumana yes please dr sumana can you help us with this case Uh, yes, the sure. patient is uh, this behaving like a salt wasting, and but the seventeen OHP and cortisol is normal. So, so what you, with what so scenario we are dealing with? Right. So one month old boy, as we can see, uh, with failure to thrive, not has suboptimal uh, weight gain, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, uh, you know, simulating C H like scenario. However, we have everything ready at hand. You have done a fantastic job so far, Diva. So seventeen OHP is normal. Cortisol is uh, appropriately high here, uh, and of course. PRA and aldosterone are high, so this is although they, despite hyponatremia, that this is a situation of like aldosterone resistance. So aldosterone is high, but we are still having hyponatremia. So I think there is something else going on with the history that you gave. It seems the baby is having some sort of an infection because of reduced feeding and lethargy. Can you give me some more uh, information in terms of yes, any yes. other urine test that you did or anything yes, like that? Yes, considering this infection, we sent the urine routine. and we found that the, it showed a greater than 100 uh, pusses in the urine mm -hmm. they you go so we have a full blown uh, urinary tract inf infection there very common uh, scenario that we get in the neonates actually i mean not too uncommon i must say uh, did you do an ultrasound too yes ma'am uh, the ultrasound showed there was a obstruction in the urinary tract also 
Right. Uh, so a very, very interesting scenario and should not be forgotten that uh, in this kind of uh, situation where we get pseudo uh, like aldosterone high but hyponatremia, uh, we should uh, in, in this kind of age group, we should always rule out uh, tubulopathies and obstructions, anomalies and uh, rule out UTI because it has been uh, seen that in these cases, there is a transient hypo pseudo hypoaldosteronism like picture, which responds brilliantly to the treatment of the primary cause that is the infection. Infection. So here, I, because there is an urine infection going on, once the baby is treated for urine infection, this thing will totally, uh, the dyslectromia will be corrected and the baby will uh, get better in no time. This is very, very important. Uh, I mean, uh, we have got many articles, if you look at them, they have shown that very typically um, POV, posterior urethral valves, basic urethral reflux, and all those things have been seen to be associated with this kind of transient uh, PHA3 like picture, actually. So ma'am, what key messages would you like to give? Yes, so again, uh, we should always rule out the common causes like infection, UTI, and sepsis, uh, which, which might cause a transient pseudo hypoaldosteronism like picture before embarking on further management because it is a very, um, it has a good prognosis and re uh, response promptly with treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, um, like ma'am has said, sometimes a very simple investigation like urine. Uh, routine microscopy can help up can help us very much so now moving towards the next so just before we start with regards to the further aspect of hyponatremia just the treatment of hyponatremia it depends upon the duration and the symptoms so if you have somebody who has got a recent onset scenario and the child is symptomatic you can then give a rapid correction remember if you raise the sodium levels very rapidly you may cause cells to shrink. They are already swollen, but then there is an effect of idiogenic osmosis which causes them to maintain a normal shape. But suddenly, if you push a lot of sodium, it will cause shrinkage and there will be osmotic disequilibrium syndrome. So unless there is acute severe hyponatremia, hyponatremia do not give 3% saline. In this scenario, you can give 3% saline to raise the levels. If you have mild to moderate, you can then give a low dose and follow up. If it is above 48 hours, generally be a bit more cautious. In that scenario, you only give 3% saline if there is a coma or seizures. So again, depending upon the symptomatology, you decide what correction is to be given. And then you don't want to raise the sodium at a very rapid rate. Typical rise will be around 6 to 8 millimoles per liter per day. Moving on to hypernatremia. Now, hypernatremia could be because of either reduced free water, because water is less, that is because of reduced intake like uh, neonate typically or adipsia, or increased loss, which could be extra renal because of sweating. So, we see a lot of people in high temperature, they can have the scenario or diarrhea, in which all these scenarios, your urinary sodium will be on the lower side and you will be dehydrated. Or you have a renal loss in which you have a problem in ABP production. Or resistance. So now you have central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. On the other hand, you can rarely have sodium load, which is extremely uncommon. So as discussed, hyperaldosteronism does not cause hypernatremia because the ANP comes into the picture. And exogenous cause, of course, if you have an inappropriately produced ORS, that can cause this scenario. Here, your urinary sodium will be high. So the most important investigation in a child with hypernatremia is urinary sodium. That will give you an important clue and you will identify the picture. So the approach is you rule out the common causes like salt load, mannitol use and diabetes. Look at urinary osmolality. If it's low, hypernatremia with low urinary osmolality is DI. Do not go for water deprivation test. The child will die. So in that scenario, you look for AVP response present. It's central DI. Absent, it is nephrogenic DI. If urinary osmolality is high, then DI is excluded. Look at urinary sodium. If it's high, you are dealing with a load. If it's low, you are dealing with an extra renal cause or you can have osmotic diuresis. So again, urinary osmolality and sodium will give you a classical clue in that scenario. So Dr. Vibha will carry forward with the cases in this regards. Oh, so we have this next case. Uh, we have this three-month-old girl. Uh, she was brought to the hospital. Uh, she has an altered sensorium. And her uh, sodium level was 140, 170, sorry, and potassium was 
urinos quality was on the lower side 110 so i advise the water deprivation test so yeah. dr vidu do you agree uh, with this water deprivation test at this level of sodium thank you for the question so now we have a three month old child and it is said that the baby has altered sensorium and we look on to the sodium it is very high so whenever the sodium is very high altered sensorium we have to correct the sodium we shouldn't go for a water deprivation test in case we went for that we would get a bad prognosis the child would again become bad may throw seizures or go into coma or become unstable and it can even have a yes. bad outcome yes. so first we have to uh, uh, so that is what uh, we, uh, yes. ideally we are not supposed to do the water deprivation yes, test ma'am the water deprivation test triggered seizures in this case okay so ma'am what should uh. be the ideal approach uh, uh, in this case when the, we have this uh, high sodium uh, so when high uh, sodium is there we have to ideally correct the sodium and coming to the diagnosis part since uh, the urin uh, urinary osmolality is low and the urinary sodium value we have to see. So then we have to distinguish between the, whether it is a central di uh, diabetes insipidus or it is a, so if it's central, then we have to know, to, uh, know the AVP response. Uh, when we give the AVP and uh, the AVP response was present. Uh, so uh, now it comes to it, it is a central DI. Right. So, ma'am, what key message would you like to give from this case? So, it's always like whenever we approach a case, we should first see that whether the patient is stable or not. So, in this case, we are just going into seeing whether the child, has, how is the child's uh, uh, CNS uh, general condition. So, now we understood altered sensorium. Then we point on to the sodium. We already know that hypernatremia is there. So, first we are going to correct that. And once the patient is settled, uh, is out of danger, then we can go into the diagnosis part and as the flow, uh, flow chart shows, we can correctly diagnose the child. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, as ma'am has correctly said, that at this high level of sodium, like uh, 170 level, uh, this uh, advising the water deprivation test could be harmful to the patient as in this case, it has triggered seizures. So in these type of cases, we should not go for water deprivation takes directly. We should go for the AVP response. And if the by giving the AVP, the osmolality has increased. It means there is a central DI. If there is no response, then we are dealing with the nephrogenic T. So now moving towards the next case, we have this 14-day-old girl uh, who came to us uh, with the failure to thrive. She has lost weight. Uh, 300 gram from her birth weight. She was born to a primary gravida and she was exclusively breastfed according to her mother. Her serum sodium was 182, which was quite high. And when we did the urine osmolality, it was 1000. So, Dr. Pragya, uh, what could be the cause of such a high sodium in this 14, year, 14 day old girl? Uh, so as we can see, this was a 14-day girl born to a primary gravida mother and was exclusively breastfed. Right? Yes, and uh, serum sodium was 182. The urine okay. osmolality was 1000, which was a, this, this is a hyperosmolar urine with a sodium load as we can see. Yes, so urine sodium was 110. Urine sodium was also very high. So this, this is most likely a case of breast milk hypernatremia, which usually occurs in a prime, uh, in primary gravida mothers due to inadequate milk secretion. And as the babies are exclusively, exclusively breastfed, they, uh, they suffer from a sodium load. It's not that breast milk has a very high sodium concentration, but just due to inadequacy of uh, feeding, uh, they suffer from this condition. This is a potentially lethal condition and the prevention from this condition is the best modality. So every primary gravida should be properly uh, trained and educated regarding this condition. Ma'am, what key messages would you so like to give? The key get? message I would, I would like to give is that high, ser high serum and urine sodium indicate a high sodium load. And as I said, breast milk hypernatremia is a condition that that is seen in primary gravida mothers due to inadequacy of milk secretion and 
they should be uh, well uh, they should be trained well in advance regarding this condition so that, that that it could be prevented as it is a potentially lethal condition and this is a very very dangerous condition so it is recommended that at day 14 we should ideally measure all children with their weight they should have regained weight by that time and if you have a child who presents you with this severe hypernatremia go for a dialysis don't wait and watch because otherwise there will be acidosis and the whole scenario will really spiral out so such severe hypernatremia dialysis be ready seizures will happen because you're cutting down sodium quickly you will have hyponatremic seizures but don't worry you give three percent saline bring it down because otherwise the child will die so this is something which is a very very dangerous parents are happy because child is sleeping they feel the child is sleeping and urine output they don't know how much they are passing so these are the two methods they should look at birth weight and wait at 14 days and whether they are passing enough urine this is a very very preventable cause of hypernatremia Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pragya. Now, moving towards the next case. We have this 13-year-old boy who was admitted to, for encephalitis in the PICU. And he was uh, uh, on the ventilator. And we got a, PI, a call from the PICU because he suddenly started pass, passing lots of urine. There was polyuria with the 10 ml per kg per hour. And the sodium serum sodium level was 180, uh, 180 millimole and urine was quality was 120. That is uh, quite low. And when the AVP was given, it uh, the urine source quality increased. So, Dr. Kamblesh, what do you think? What has happened suddenly in this child? What uh, causes the polyuria in this patient? Thank you, Dr. Viva. As a child is having the encephalitis and is on ventilator, and we are seeing that he has developed hypernatremia with polyuria and urine osmolality is less than 600 milliosmos. So uh, we have, uh, as the Dr. Doctor already told that we look for urine osmolality if it is less than 600, then we uh, we have to look for the AVP response, and the AVP response is uh, there is more increase in the urine osmolality. So the child is suffering from the brain di uh, brain death di diabetes central diabetes insipidus that has caused the polyuria in this child. Right, so very well said. And uh, how do you, uh, Doctor Vibha, why do you think that if somebody develops di because of brain damage, why is it diffuse? You think? why is it not focal? Um, so I'm not getting the question. because the AVP neurons are, are, the, um, are very widely, widely separated. Widely Sir, actually, the, uh, the neurons in the AVP secreting neurons are the diffusely located in the different one centimeter apart in the uh, cortex and they converge in the pituitary stock. And if the diffuse involvement is there in the encephalitis, that one can cause the DI. Otherwise, small uh, lesion will not cause the one DI. or two infarcts or other hemorrhages will not cause the problem. You need to have a much bigger insult. Bigger so, a sick child developing DI. Earlier, we used to say brain death. The yeah. the child is this is a marker of a very serious disease. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. So I think that's something which is yes, the key sir. message is consider brain death with severe in, and you have to options are fluid replacement. We don't want to go into too much into that yes. in that way. So when we correct hypernatremia again, the message is you need to have a slow correction over forty eight hours. You use maintenance, which is four to one, followed by free water deficit. For every 1 millimole per liter rise in sodium, there is a 4 ml per kg free water deficit. So then you calculate it accordingly by 4 ml per kg. And then you look at the ongoing urinary loss. You add all of that, give it evenly, you will get the right formula. Now, remember, you don't want a rapid fall. If it's an acute condition, you want 9 to 12 millimoles per liter per day. If it's chronic, 6 to 9. Now, remember, whatever you do, you will have a rapid fall often and you may have seizures. So, do not give too much, too little sodium also. 70 to 100 millimoles per liter is usually good enough, around 20% above the maintenance. And monitor sodium very carefully. If you have seizures, what will you do? So, Dr. Dhwani, if you have hypernatremia and you treat somebody, develop seizures, what will you do? Yeah. So you have a very rapid fall, which is causing this seizure. So you give extra 3% saline to carry. If you have hyponatremia and you're having a rapid correction, what will you do? You See. give free water. So that is the option. Or you give an AVP. So that is a re-lowering. This is re-rising. So you give 3% saline to 
correct that in that scenario. We have in our application tool which allows calculation of how much fluid rate you want to give in that perspective in hypernatremia also for hyponatremia. Now coming to the last part of hypokalemia, hypokalemia can be because of intracellular shift in the setting of insulin excess because of decay, because of malnutrition, rapid correction of fluid status, beta agonist, you can have intestinal loss. So typically diarrhea, that will be a typical scenario as well as vomiting. Now diarrhea will cause hypokalemia with acidosis while vomiting will cause hypokalemia with alkalosis. And then you can of course have a renal loss in which you will have usually metabolic alkalosis because of frusamide thiazide or if you have RTA you will have acidosis. So what is important to remember is that everybody who has hypokalemia usually will have metabolic alkalosis. If you have metabolic acidosis think of GI loss and RTA. So pH is one of the most important investigations to look at in the setting of hypokalemia. So hypokalemia has discussed cellular shift, extra renal loss, potassium is low while if you have a urinary loss, your urinary potassium will be high. In this scenario, this could be RAS dependent in which you will have hypertension, aldosteronism, high aldosterone or rare forms of Lidl and 11 hydroxyl which we discussed yesterday. And other scenario could be if you have a situation in which you have a RAS independent situation like tubulopathy, you will have alkalosis, RTA, you will have acidosis and osmotic diuresis. So looking at that, what you're mainly looking at is urinary potassium and you are looking also in terms of the aldosterone and the renin axis, which will give you a picture. So if typically you talk about hypokalemia, if your volume is high, that is RAS excess. Otherwise, they are usually a secondary hyperaldosteronism. Anybody to have persistent hypokalemia should have a high aldosterone, whether it is primary or secondary. Anybody to have persistent hyponatremia should have a high ABP whether it is appropriate or inappropriate. So same, LDO will be high, but if you have volume excess, that is a primary hyperaldosteronism. Urinary chloride, again indicating how much loss you are having. pH, as I said, if you have acidosis with hypokalemia, diarrhea and RT. So acidosis really makes it much narrow. Of course, anybody with chronic hypokalemia, anybody with chronic hypocalcemia, anybody with metabolic alkalosis, look at magnesium. This is an important message there and blood pressure. So approach is look at blood gas. If blood gas shows acidosis, this is either diarrhea or RTA. Look at urinary anion gap. If it's positive, it is RTA. Negative, it is GI loss. If there is alkalosis and you have got hypotension, you're thinking of tubulopathy or the BP is normal, not high. Look at hypercalciuria. That will be Barter syndrome. Otherwise, it will be Gittleman syndrome. If your blood pressure is high, so you have hypertension along with hypokalemic alkalosis, you are dealing with aldosterone excess. What is the aldosterone? It's high, it's primary hyperaldosteronism. Aldosterone is low. Look at DOC dependent causes, which will be the CH variants, 11 and 17 hydroxylase. And if they are both normal, so you have got a aldosterone which is low, DOC which is low, renin which is low. So what is happening? You look at aldectone response. If the child responds to aldectone, that is a apparent millocorticoid excess, no response is Little syndrome. So hypokalemia approach is blood gas, acidosis, diarrhea versus RTA. If you have alkalosis, look at blood pressure, hypertension, you look at low renin causes of hypertension, normal tension, look at diuretic versus Barter and Gittleman syndrome. So we'll carry forward from there, Dr. Vibha, with the next case. Thank you, sir. We have this two month old boy with hypokalemia and uh, the blood test shows acidosis and the bare sexes was minus 16. And when we did the, well, calculated the anion gap, it was 12. So uh, we are in dilemma whether it is diarrhea or RTA. So Dr. Sumana, could you help with this condition ki whether it is diarrhea or RTA? Thanks, Dr. Bipha. That's an easy one because sir just explained to us as per the protocol, if the blood gas shows that rare combo of normal anion gap acidosis with hypokalemia, very rare one, then we should uh, think of either diarrhea or RTA. Now, I would like to ask, is, is there any history of polyuria or anything in this baby at all? No, ma'am, there was no polyuria. Okay, so I would next uh, like to go on to the urinary anion gap then. Do you have any reports for me? Right, ma'am. 
uh, it was urine sodium was 120, potassium was 20, and chloride was uh, 220. So the urine anion gap was minus 120. Correct. So that's a negative uh, urine anion gap. So uh, this again, so going back to the protocol as Sir has been explaining all this while. So normal anion gap uh, acidosis with hypokalemia with a negative urinary anion gap um, indicates probably it's a case of uh, um, diarrhea. We would like to uh, instead of RT, we would like to know about the urine potassium creatinine ratio if you have that. Yeah, ma'am. It was uh, normal. It was not very raised. So yes, so that is another point that it's the, the loss of potassium is probably extra renal and not renal. So we have the diagnosis of diarrhea here instead of RTA. Hey, Ma'am, what are the key messages from this case? Right, so um, uh, like we discussed uh, that um, in any case of uh, acidosis with hypokalemia, we should think about the two diagnoses, RTA or diarrhea, diarrhea being of course more common, uh, but then we should, not, uh, we should always do the urinary anion gap uh, to come to the diagnosis. That's a clue. Thank, Thank you, you so much, ma'am. Because you. differentiating these two is important because the man, um, line of management is completely it's different. It's totally different, of Thank course. You. Of course. Thank you so much, ma'am. So moving towards the next case, we have this three-month-old girl who came to us with a failure to thrive with hypokalemia. Uh, she had gained only 700 gram in this three months. Uh, uh, the blood gas shows alkalosis. Uh, BP was the BP was normal uh, for this age. Uh, so, Doctor Vidhu, could you help us with this case? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. So now we are, have a baby who has failure to thrive, and in the scenario, we almost understand that the baby has persistent hypokalemic alkalosis. Right. Now, in the flow chart, Sir has explained that. Whenever alkalosis is there, hypokalemic alkalosis is there, a next step what we have to look into is about the blood pressure of the baby. Right. Uh, so I can see that the blood pressure is it's in the normal. normal range. So once we know that the blood pressure is in the normal range, we are thinking more about barter. But to make sure, we have to also see about the uh, hypercalciuria or the urinary calcium excretion. Uh, so, okay. So... Whenever in a case of suspecting, you're suspecting BATAs, at the child, if the child has an early, usually the children will have an early urinary uh, hypercalciuria. Or in the scan, you can see nephrocalcinosis. Then it almost shows the diagnosis. So we have a child with persistent hypokalemic alkalosis with normal BP and who has nephrocalcinosis or hypercalciuria. So BATA central. Okay. Ma'am, what key messages would you like to give? So the same thing, what I said. So first, when you get persistent hypokalemic alkalosis, first check at the BP. If the BP is normal, then go to the calcium. Uh, this is by order you are checking. And then if it's uh, hypercalciuria is there, then it can, can be used. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. So as ma'am has rightly said, if the BP is normal and we have the alkalosis, so we should get the urinary calcium done and we have we should get the ultrasound uh, for the KUB done to get the uh, information about the nephrocalcinosis. So uh, moving towards the next case, uh, we have this 80-year-old boy who came to us with the early puberty when we, uh, the height was 134 and the pubic hair was stage 4. And the blood gas shows alkalosis and there was hypokalemia. And the urinary chloride was 100 and the blood pressure was on the higher side for this uh, age. So, Dr. Pragya. So, Dr. Vibha. Uh, could you help with this case? Yeah. So, the uh, case you have given is a 8-year child with a precocious puberty right, and hypokalemic alkalosis, a urine chloride on higher side and hypertension. High blood pressure, right. So uh, here we would first go for, as we have gone already uh, given the blood gas analysis, we have seen the BPs on higher side. We will go for the aldosterone uh, levels. So if the, uh, have we done aldosterone levels? Yes, aldosterone level was low. So if the aldosterone level was low, we will go for 
DOC and 11 DOC levels. Can you tell me more about external genitalia, Dr. Vibha? Because yeah, as yeah. there is there so is... When we did the examination, it was quite surprising the genit uh, gonads were not palpable. Okay. So most likely we will, if uh, in this scenario, if uh, uh, the DOC and 11 DOC should be high, and we are seeing a case of 11 hydroxylase deficiency and uh, most likely this is a female who has uh, a high, who is hyper virilized and is being ra raised as a male and uh, due to the precocious puberty she has uh, we have caught her now uh, as a case of uh, hypokalemia and alkalosis so I would, uh, I would say that this is a case of 11 hydroxylase deficiency. 11 hydroxylase is an enzyme which converts DOC to corticosterone and 11 DOC to cortisol. So uh, in this case, as this conversion cannot happen, DOC and 11 DOC will be raised. These have a weak mineralocorticoid activity due to which these cases are uh, many a times missed in earlier age group and present later with a hypervirilized uh, like, uh, condition and hypertension along with electrolyte imbalance, hypokalemia and uh, alkalosis. So ma'am, what key messages would you like to give? So the key messages in this case would be Dr. Vibha that hypertension with alkalosis, we should rule out CAH as uh, this is a very treatable condition and could be, uh, uh, and, uh, could be treated easily. And in a XX DSD, 11 hydroxylase defect should be ruled out everything. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, as it was discussed yesterday also for the DSD session, uh, the examination of genitalia and examination of the gonads, palpation of the gonads is uh, essential in the cases when we are dealing with hypertension, alkalosis, and the electrolyte imbalance. So thank you very much for this session. You're welcome. So I think this was a very, very interactive session on the electrolyte disorders, and we were able to discuss a lot of these disorders. So I'd like to thank Dr. Vidhu, uh, Dr. Sumana, Dr. Pragya, and Dr. Kamlesh, along with Dr. Vibha, who uh, conducted the session very well. We'll see if there are any questions before we wind up the session. So uh, can magnesium levels be used to differentiate Bartel and Gittleman syndrome like urinary calcium levels? So Dr. Bharani, that's a very valid point. But usually, Bartert will also be losing magnesium. So they will also often have hypomagnesemia. So while hypomagnesemia is a predominant presentation for Gittleman syndrome, you will have more cramp-like presentation and later onset uh, failure to thrive. It is not the absolute differentiating feature in this scenario. So I would say magnesium levels may be relevant, but most important will be hypercalciuria. So there will be a lack of calcium excretion. So just remember, Barter syndrome is like frusamide excess. You are losing sodium, potassium, chloride, hypercalciuria, while Gittleman syndrome is like a thiazide excess. So you will not have hypercalciuria, you will actually have hypocalciuria. So I think that was an important point. So at the end of the session, I'd like to thank Dr. Vidhu, Dr. Sumana, Dr. Pragya, Dr. Kamlesh and um, Dr. Vibha again for this wonderful session. And we will now move forward with regards to our next session. So we already covered two important parts. We have discussed already about the calcium and electrolytes. Now we move towards the third part, which is glucose. And we will be discussing in uh, regarding two different modules. One would be about DK, which is, of course, a very important acute emergency. The second will also be with regards to the management of hypoglycemia, because that itself is, again, an important thing to remember in that perspective. So we will be starting our first session, which will be there with regards to the DKA. And again, we have got uh, a wonderful team of experts, which will be working with regards to us on DKA, which is one of the most important uh, treatable causes of death as far as pediatric endocrinology is concerned. So for this session, uh, I am honored to have with me uh, four stalwarts, and uh, they are from different parts of the country. Dr. Anjali, who is there from Calicut again. So we've got two people from the same medical college. Uh, Dr. Vidhu was there in the last session, and now we have Dr. Anjali. Dr. Vikas from Aligarh, who has been working a lot with regards to pediatric endocrinology. Dr. Hemang, I'm specifically taking his name as the 
a stalwart because he has developed a validated mobile application which guides each and every step of management of DK. And we'll talk a bit about how he developed that. And Dr. Naveen, who has just recently passed out, and uh, he is currently in Lucknow. I'll also be joined by Dr. Sayan regarding the case presentation in the grand round. So we will start with this unfortunate case, four-year-old girl who received fluid and insulin from outside had hypokalemia, was given normal saline and then was given insulin. Now what happened is suddenly she developed hypokalemia and arrhythmia. So the problem here is that there was significant hypokalemia which was missed and that had a lethal consequence. So we need to be wary that DK is common. We've always been told that India is a country with low prevalence of diabetes. So it's actually not low prevalence. It is basically not picking up at the right time. So this is something which is very, very important. And we are missing a large number of children in that regards. So just to touch base on, DK basically is insulin deficiency and counter-regulatory excess. Both of them play an important role in the pathogenesis. Insulin deficiency causes ketosis. So you have lipolysis, you have ketogenesis, and ketones cause estrotic breathing, abdominal pain, QT odor, and all the other problems from there. While counter-regulatory excess and insulin deficiency will cause increased process of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis causing hyperglycemia, which then causes osmotic diuresis causing loss of sodium, potassium, water, phosphorus, and a lot of other compounds along with that. So you have a combination of ketoacidosis on one hand and you have severe dehydration, which is responsible in this scenario. So what happens with DK? We all know that there is dehydration, but that is 7 to 10 percent. We, however, do not appropriately clinically assess hydration because there are problems. If you look at tongue, it may be more dry because the child is breathing. If you look at skin turgor, the child will have increased osmolarity, so skin turgor may be preserved. So most important measures are capillary refill and blood pressure and oliguria. Then the other thing to remember is that we often say go low in terms of hydration. Second is if a child with DK has shock. Shock is unusual in DK because there is a counter-regulatory hormone excess. You've got a lot of epinephrine, you've got a lot of uh, cortisol, you've got a lot of AVP. So why would shock develop? Is there is something else going on. So you have to be worried about in that perspective. Now, there is, of course, a significant sodium deficit, but we tend to overestimate the deficit. Remember the last session, we said that for every 100 milligram per DL rise in glucose, the sodium goes down by 1.6 to 2. You can use any of these criteria, and that is important to remember to use a corrected sodium in that scenario. The third important thing is potassium. There is a huge potassium deficit, but we tend to underestimate the potassium deficit. Because, because of metabolic acidosis and insulin deficiency, potassium has come out of the cell. Once you treat, this potassium will go in and for every 0.1 decrease in pH, the potassium goes up by 0.6. So if you have a pH of 6.8, the potassium should actually be subtracted by 3 to 4 points. So you should know that even if your potassium is 5.5, you are sitting on a severe depletion of potassium and that's a very important message in that perspective. So be wary about potassium in that regard. And this is the formula I was talking about. 7.4 minus pH into 0.6. So for every 0.1 decline, 0.6 is the increase in potassium which happens in this scenario. Very important message. If you have severe DK, think phosphorus. Because if you do not give phosphorus at the right time, you will develop rhabdomyolysis, which will cause renal failure. If you have refractory hypokalemia, look at magnesium level, which is also very important. Now, treatment, of course, you give fluid. Just by fluid, you're expanding the volume and you're reducing the counter-regulatory hormones. Your glucose will come down typically by around 100 to 200. Then you start insulin and you will then lose the potassium. The glucose will further come down and your ketosis will come down. If you give too much fluid, you may cause cerebral edema you may cause hyperchloremic acidosis. If you give too much insulin, you will cause hypokalemia and that also can be dangerous. So the balance is not doing too much while not doing too little also. And that's something which is very, very important in DK. So what are we bothered about? If you give too much fluid, if there is a severe disease, if somebody gives soda bicarbonate, there could be cerebral edema. Remember, cerebral edema can happen right at diagnosis in DK 
And this particularly happens if people have been treated outside. Anybody who comes to you with DK, who has got altered sensorium, low GCS, think that cerebral edema may be there. Other markers are pH less than 6.9 and a CO2 level which is less than 10. CO2 level should never be less than 10 because whatever bicarb is, if you correct for it, it should be more than around 11 or 12. So a CO2 less than 10 indicates a hyperventilation. So there is something going on already and that's something which is important. So you have to worry about that because this is a high mortality morbidity. Very importantly, give less fluids, lower correction to prevent. And we'll discuss about that. And mannitol can also be effective. Now, hypokalemia will happen if you give insulin. So you have to supplement potassium. So every child who is having DK, give 40 millimoles per liter of potassium. If you have a child who has hypokalemia at presentation, like the first child, start potassium in the hydration fluid. That's very, very important. And very importantly, if you have persistent ketosis, if you have infection, if you have too much chloride, you will also develop hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, which you have to worry about. But do not give soda bicarbonate unless the child is dying because of severe hyperkalemia or there is a problem like a cardiac compromise. That is the only indication where soda bicarbonate is required. Be wary of infections. So if you have fever, it is again a cause of concern. High counts may happen as part of DK. I've seen 30,000, 35,000. Don't worry immediately. But if you have fever, there is a cause of worry. Very importantly, it's a hyperosmolar state. So do not put a central line. If you have to put a central line, give a low molecular weight heparin. That's very, very important. And if suddenly the child develops leg pain, hematuria, Oliguria, think of rhabdomyolysis, typically because of hypophosphatemia in that scenario. So now we'll start off with the first case. Dr. Sayan will take over from here. Uh, thank you, sir, for taking us through the summary of diabetes and its management. Uh, moving forward to the first case, this was a four-year-old girl presenting to us with severe decay. Now, was managed as a case of diarrhea, so given uh, various amounts of fluids and referred to us. Now, on presentation, had severe acidosis at pH of 6.8. Bicarbonate was almost undetectable at 4. And ketones were very high at 7.1. On presentation, was drowsy and had anisocoria. Also had brisk reflexes. So, Dr. Anjali, could you tell me the immediate uh, management that we need to do at this point of time? Thank you. This is a 4-year-old girl with severe DKA. Managed as diarrhea. On examination, child was drowsy and isochoric with brisk reflexes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. You are audible. Okay. Yes. Can this, you is a case yeah. of, this is a case of severe DKA with cerebral edema at the time of diagnosis itself. Mm. So, beware of fluid therapy, prior fluid therapy. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. And any uh, immediate uh, management that you would like to give in this case? We should uh, immediately give manitol as soon as we diagnose cerebral edema. Yeah. And also, fluid should be given in a slow slow manner over 72 hours. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are the giveaway messages that you would like to tell us? As in this case, we should always be uh, beware of prior fluid treatment. And also watch for cerebral edema at any time during the DK management. And also slow correction of IV fluids is required in order to prevent cerebral edema. Yes, so thank you for this wonderful message. This also, sir, tells us that every time when the patients present to us, at any point of time suspecting cerebral edema, give mannitol straight away. Don't wait. And thank you for wonderfully taking us through this case. Now, moving forward to the next case, we have an 11-month boy. Presenting to us with failure to thrive. Had a pH which was pretty low at 7. Ketone was high at 4.4. Had a random blood glucose of 440. So doc Dr. Vikas, is this decay and how will we manage the same? Dr. Vikas? Uh, Dr. Vikas, can you hear me? 
so uh, moving forward with this case so this was a 11 month old boy with high sugars ph low and ketones high so this is actually a case of dka now will we give bolus is the first question now as this child doesn't have any features of cerebral edema we will move ahead with the bolus in this case now the duration of therapy as this is a very small kid so so i think uh, this is an interesting case scenario because we are dealing with a situation uh where in uh, we have got a very very high risk in particular what we are looking at as dr sain has said that this is a infant so of course we have to give a bolus in this scenario but the duration may be more long because we don't want a very rapid correction insulin also we want at a lower dose because now many people actually consider 0.05 as a low dose as a standard dose also but in infant we want to use a lower dose and we have to worry about cerebral edema i think that's a big message coming from there yes so um, uh, moving forward to the next case now we have a 9 year old girl who is very emaciated having a random blood glucose of 600 again ph low at 7.1 ketone high so this is again a dk girl but she is very emaciated so dr hema yeah. any modifications to the protocol that you would suggest in this case am i audible dr hema dr shay uh, yes sir you are audible now sir i was right from beginning okay so we couldn't hear you in the uh, next case we will uh, no uh, sure. Uh, sure sure please carry on yeah thank you sir so dr himang can you hear me uh, thank you dr sayan yeah. uh is uh, i can see <coughs> this is a 9 year old girl presented with uh, hyperglycemia acidosis and ketosis this case is a case of a dk uh, so yes we will start uh, management with fluid bolus and uh, duration should be over 48 hours but the child is emaciated so we should start uh, low dose insulin to uh, because this child might have a low potassium reserve so so uh, to check for hypokalemia is the first thing and we should start with the low insulin dose and uh, <coughs> we should aggressively look for the hypokalemia as well as sir says as hypomagnesemia could be one of the cause so potassium and magnesium should be kept watch in this case so a very important point you uh, told us so two modifications one is if an infant and a, a emaciated child which should start with low dose and as you very well mentioned low potassium along with low magnesium we should always be careful of thank you dr himang moving forward to the next case we have a 3 year old boy with severe diabetic ketoacidosis now this is different from the other previous cases this was managed outside as dk for 6 hours had a ph which was 6.9 bicarb undetectable ketone still 6.4 but also had a very low potassium at 2.8 millimoles per liter so dr navin are you thank here? you doc yeah, yeah. So, thank you doc how would you like to manage this case thank you dr sain uh, this is a 3 year old boy who was managed in the peripheral setting uh, under the uh, as uh, severe dk and uh, we also have uh, one of the dangerous complication of dk as uh, hypokalemia here this could probably because of the fact that uh, potassium was not administered during the initial management so potassium is something that is very important and we need to identify the potassium level during the management of dk so based on the potassium level we need to assess the potassium and we need to start on the therapy in case if the potassium level is less than 3.3 then we need to give potassium supplementation immediately in the hydration fluid which was discussed in the early presentation by dr anurag and uh, when the potassium level is between 3.3 to 6 millimoles per liter then we need to add potassium in the maintenance phase and if the potassium level is more than 6 then we can defer potassium and start potassium in case the potassium level fall down during the treatment which is expected because of the insulin therapy so in this case so first thing i would like to say that we need to start potassium immediately in the hydration phase and we may also like, would like, would want to defer insulin until the potassium normalizes the second thing with regard to the administration of potassium in a patient with severe uh, acidosis as already mentioned by dr anra we also expect hypophosphatemia so we would like to administer potassium as 50% potassium chloride and 50% potassium phosphorus which would take care of also of the hypophosphatemia 
and third thing in a condition of insulin deficiency and metabolic acidosis the most common thing which we encounter is hyperkalemia but hypokalemia in such a ah. situation requires a ruling on the possibility of celiac disease and in this case i would like to rule out celiac disease during the immediate follow up so yeah. hypokalemia is very common but it is not seen at that uh, in, at the initiation it is usually seen during the the management course and uh, in case <laughs> the patient is having hypokalemia a diagnosis it can result in fulminant arrhythmias and uh, sometimes possibly disastrous consequence so based on the high potassium levels we need to start potassium immediately in the hydration phase if the potassium levels are less than 3.5 and uh, this being a very common scenario how can we improve the quality of care i would like to uh, request uh, dr hemang to emphasize on improving the quality of care so i think this was a big challenge because despite having a written protocol when we were trying to look at our own audit we were not finding that there was a good result or of changes were done and especially when you have the initial treatment written in the first hour as we always always say golden hour if you are missing <coughs> you will have a problem so dr hemang we came up with a brilliant strategy so dr hemang can you please brief about your uh, work uh Uh, we have gone through a uh, hundred case of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, and we will uh, we have evaluated. In only eighteen percent of the cases, we have found that there was no error, and the uh, child was managed hundred percent as per protocol. But the rest of them, there were several errors, like uh, we uh, missed the boluses or uh, fluid calculation error was there. We have given a uh, less potassium or uh, delayed initiation of the dextrose despite uh, uh, having a hypoglycemia. so in 17% of the patient may have two or more errors and uh, uh, three important uh, 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 complications of hypoglycemia hypokalemia and dehydration management uh, 68% of the hypoglycemia uh, 42% of the hypokalemia and 66% of the dehydration can be prevented if we stick to the protocol so how to stick to the protocol so we have developed uh, one uh, medi classes endocrinology mobile app in which you have to enter a date of birth weight <coughs> blood sugar ketone and all the necessary parameters and <coughs> at the end uh, you just have to click and it will guide correct Uh, management for the case of diabetic ketoacidosis ha 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 to baat us par mulaqat kar le yeah so uh, and another thing is uh, one of the follow up case how is the patient so after kena chale aap since uh, how many hours of the admission you are looking at the patient you just need to enter weight blood glucose initial sodium initial gcs and current gcs current sodium and current glucose it will give you a fall in uh, uh, serum osmolality um, more than expected and whether your child is at the risk of hypocal uh, uh, cerebral edema or not and how to modify your current management and <coughs> this app will help to point to uh, it it will help as a, a point of care guide to manage dka Uh, strictly as per protocol so i think that is a wonderful input <clears throat> which uh, hemang has developed it's available in our mobile application it really helps in terms of point of care management as far as latest guidelines it provides guidance for immediate and follow up care in that scenario so this is how we can think of improving the quality of care so carry forward from there dr sain uh thank you so much dr hemang uh, moving forward to the next case now this was a 10 year old girl very <coughs> high blood sugars at 540 body weight of 30 kg at presentation had metabolic acidosis ph of 6.9 dehydration at 10% so dr anjali uh, kindly tell us how to manage this case from here on a fresh case presenting to us with dk severe dehydration thank you dr sain this is a case of severe dk with dehydration 10 percentage here ph is less than 7 bicarbonate less than 5 this should be treated in an icu setup the markers of severe dk are low co2 high lactate high anion gap high blood urea nitrogen 
ICU admission is indicated in pH less than 7.1, age less than 5 years, with altered sensorium and low CO2. And also fluid should be given uh, during the next 48 hours. According to ESPAC guidelines, we should calculate maintenance plus deficit. Maintenance should be calculated according to 4 to 1 formula, that is 70 ml per hour, and deficit by uh, from dehydration. We, we are considering <coughs> dehydration as 10%, then 62.5 ml per hour. Yeah. Then the total uh, fluid should be 135 ml per hour should be corrected in a, in 48 hours. Yes. We should uh, correct slowly in order to prevent cerebral edema. Uh, yes, Dr. Anjali, thank you so much for taking us through the uh, calculations. But uh, Dr. Anurag and Dr. Himang has also come out with the DK initial applications where you just have to enter the initial parameters pH, ketones, blood sugar, age of the child, PCO2 and the potassium and you get a direct prescription immediately. And this is how they also showed via their research that this can cut down on the errors that we are committing and taking the patient to complications. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is the output that you will get and you can immediately start management on this format. So this will cut down on the errors that we are committing in spite of the availability of guidelines. Yeah. So... Uh, so, uh, so, so, sir, so Dr. Vikas, we have now started the initial management of the child. Now, coming to monitoring, what are the things that we should keep in mind during monitoring this child with severe decay at presentation? Thank you, Dr. Sain. Basically, decay is a situation where you cannot have a morning and evening round. You have to have a very close monitoring even after the initiation of the initial treatment plan. And as we can always see that uh, monitoring is out of two parameters. One is clinical monitoring, other is lab monitoring. Clinically, you should look for the sensorium. You should look for the heart rate. You should look for the blood pressure. You should look for the you should look for the hydration phase. So always have a close watch on the sensorium of your child. Is your child is irritable? Is your child is very well oriented in the time, space, and person? Any any sudden deterioration in the neurological sign? Any uh, cranial palsy? So you have to act very fast and identify all the pointers of the decay all the pointers of cerebral edema. Secondly, look at the hydration. Hydration, you can see about the, if you if the child is passing urine adequately around 1 ml per kg per hour, you can be assured that your child is very well dehydrated. Very well hydrated. Because you cannot afford cerebral edema, dehydration, and uh, oliguria. Now, apart from your clinical assessment, watch for tachycardia again, watch for blood pressure again, because blood pressure is the only sign of hydration state of a child. Think about the lab parameters. And as far as lab parameters are concerned, there are three lab parameters which is very, very important. Your pH, your sodium, and your potassium. You should at least, initially, you can have at least hourly watch on your sodium, potassium, and, and uh, pH part. What is expected and what is, uh, what is going to happen with the child? The moment you start the treatment, you are expecting your sodium will go up. But you have to be very, very careful that any rapid incline in the sodium in a setting of polyuria is again, you are going for cerebral edema. So watch for sodium. It should not go very high. It should not go very up, very high and very early. So watch for your sodium and always use corrected sodium as talked by Dr. Anurag Vajpayee, Always interpret your lab report with the clinical setting. Secondly, your potassium. What is happening is the whenever you receive a child in the DK, initially only after hydration, proper hydration can reduce your hyperglycemia and acidosis. So always, uh, you know, uh, think of twice before adding insulin to start with and always start your treatment with potassium. Monitor potassium. What is expected is that the moment you start insulin, your potassium will go down. So always monitor potassium. It, will, it should not go down very, 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 very fast. And if you are seeing a rapid decline in the potassium, add potassium, potassium in a higher dose to every child to avoid the life-threatening hypokalemia. Secondly, monitor the pH of a child. You, what, what is happening is the moment you start uh, correcting the dehydration and, uh, and hyperglycemia, your acidosis part should improve within 12 hours. But whatever, if you are seeing your pH is still goes low, your acidosis is persisting. Think about hyperchloric met metabolic acidosis or lactic acidosis or shock or uh, you can say uh, insulin deficiency. So monitoring pH, sodium, potassium and clinical uh, status of a child will go, go in a long way 
towards the outcome of dk thank you dr sain thank you so much dr vikas and this is the recurring theme that is coming to us that potassium will immediately decrease and i can't tell you the exact percentage but more than 50% children have potassium which is low during uh, during admission and on the course during hospital admission so we have to be very careful about potassium and this child after 4 hours had a blood sugar which was 650 so blood sugar which was still, uh, still persisting high and uh, base excess was minus 22 so dr vikas do we need to think about anything we are missing in this case blood sugar oh, is still, still high still we are seeing that there are two situations is going on we are having a persistent acidosis as well as the hyperglycemia so we have to think about the, our, our insulin regime whether we are giving too less insulin or whatever insulin we are giving it is binding to the tubing or or we we have to we, we have to uh, increase our infusion rate so always if, if, uh, what you should do if you are having a persistently high blood sugar and acidosis always uh, you know freshly prepared your insulin change your tube tubing and flush the tubings with insulin and even and then assess again your child uh, as far as the blood sugar and the acidosis is concerned yes dr yes. dr shain yes. <coughs> thank you sir for this wonderful uh, pointers that you have given us and uh, on and sir the child also went into shock yes okay sir so this child is not responding probably because of dilute uh, insulin and insulin binding to tube so always flush so when we flush what we find the science subsequently yes. is so according to what dr vikas said now we corrected the uh, we flushed the tubings and uh, we we find that the blood sugars have now decreased from 650 to 190 and the base excess also had start started to improve so uh, dr navin now what do you think about this case now <coughs> oh is the uh, child doing fine yeah uh since 8 hours it has been since the ons initiation of treatment this is a very common finding that we usually anticipate uh, during the management of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, first there will be a fall in the blood sugar level which usually takes around 6 to 8 hours followed by fall in the ketones level which usually takes around 10 to 14 hours followed by resolution of acidosis which usually takes around 16 to around uh, one day so this is uh, quite a normal finding and with regards to the blood glucose level we need to monitor hourly and we need to titrate the uh, dextrose content rather than stopping the insulin level in case if you are stopping insulin in such a scenario it will cause worsening of ketosis as well as acidosis so we need to monitor the dextrose blood glucose level and we need to add dextrose for so how much do you uh, recommend to add in case if the blood sugar levels is uh, below 300 I would like to add dextrose five percent, and if the blood glucose level is less than two hundred, then I would like to add dextrose of ten percent. So in this scenario, we have a blood glucose level of one ninety milligram per deciliter. So I would like to add dextrose of ten percent in this child and uh, serially monitor the blood glucose level. And I will also emphasize on the fact that we should not stop insulin because it will cause worsening of ketoacidosis. And this so is a very common persisting finding. Persisting acidosis is not a matter of concern at this point of time at eight hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is what the message. So, okay, we'll add ten percent dextrose and continue insulin as you just said. Uh, and uh, then at ten hours, we find the blood sugar is doing fine at two twenty. Base excess is minus eleven, but just see at see the potassium. It has started to decrease and is now at two point six. So, Doctor Himang, any modifications to the management at this point of time that you would advise to us? Yes, at this point of time. Uh... Actually, due to hypokalemia, hypokalemia is more dangerous than uh, correcting the acidosis. So, at this point of time, we should decrease the insulin and we should increase the potassium supplementation. And uh, as the sugar is two uh, twenty, more than two hundred, we may just uh, switch to the five percent dextrose. Yes. <coughs> so we did switch to five percent dextrose, and he was getting forty millimoles. So, so we sh- yeah. we should shift to sixty millimole per liter uh, per hour. Uh, okay. Sixty okay. millimole per liter of yeah. potassium supplementation in this case, and, and we re- reduce the. Is, po- yeah, this is often a very big problem, and often we get potassium less than two. So how rapidly we can correct? And will you, will you suggest some sort of a protocol for infusion of potassium? Because this can happen especially with outside treated patients. Yes, sir. Uh, in in such scenario, we may just uh, stop the uh, uh, insulin level for uh, if it is a uh, le- uh, around two point five or less than two point five. Uh, it may re- uh, lead to dangerous uh, arrhythmia. 
so we should uh, give a rapid correction of potassium uh, over one hour or two hours uh, that's a uh, uh, one easy method to give is a uh, weight divided by 4 and uh, that amount to be given hourly for one to two hours that will correct the sodium uh, and keep uh, bring it uh, above three uh, that will be a uh, less dangerous and we may start uh, then low dose of insulin and uh, recheck the potassium level i think that's very important so 0.3 to 1 millimole per kg per hour can sometimes have to be given we just gave in that patient who was such yes. severe this thing so this is an important message and i would say celebrate in my something which is becoming a bit less but hypokalemia is now becoming a bigger problem. So you have to be a bit bothered about hypokalemia. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Himan, for the uh, additional inputs. Uh, so now moving forward with this case, at 14 hours, the 14 hours, this girl becomes comatose. Dr. Anjali, what do you think is thank happening you. with this child? Everything was doing fine. Sugars, pH, everything is doing fine. But suddenly she becomes comatose. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sain. This is a case of severe DKA with clinical deterioration. We should always be prepared for cerebral edema at any time during the management of DKA. There may be rapid fluctuations in sugar. A rapid decline in sugar will lead to osmotic shift and cerebral edema. Yeah. Uh, as already we discussed in our first case, we already seen Cerebral edema was diagnosed at the time of admission itself. Yes. So we should prepare for cerebral edema management at any time during the DKA management. So we should give immediate, immediately manitone 2.5 ml to 5 ml per hour, ml per hour uh, in order to prevent cerebral edema. Yeah. And science, what do you mean? Yeah. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Waiting for imaging would be lethal. So we should give immediate manitol as we suspect cerebral edema. Okay, Sine, thank you. Uh, uh, there is a, now I often a debate whether you give 3% saline versus manitol. What do you prefer? So the, This is as you always say, manitol has two effects. One is it decreases the uh, cerebral edema, but also changes the nature of vas uh, va vasculopathy that occurs. So there is a big debate as to what really causes cerebral edema in DK. Some people always stick to that. There is a vasogenic theory. So you've got this shifts which is happening and all that osmotic shifts may be there, but it is a direct perfusion, hypoperfusion, reperfusion injury, just like birth asphyxia. So many people say, and in West, what is happening is that what they say, whatever protocol you follow, whatever fluid you give, there will always be a percentage who will have cerebral edema. Alike, they say that whatever you control birth, the birth asphyxia, some people will have birth asphyxia. Same thing they say like that. So probably there are two components working. One is a osmolar component, the other is a vasogenic component. So mannitol is good for both cytotoxic damage as well as osmolar damage. So mannitol is always preferred over 3% saline. So anybody who has, as Dr. Anjali said, somebody who has got DK in the bedside, have mannitol, have 10% dextrose. If the child doesn't have hypoglycemia, give mannitol. Don't worry about that. Carry on. Yeah, as you just said, waiting for any imaging would be lethal in this case. An immediate measure would be to give mannitol. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Anjali. And this is the paper that uh, Sir and uh, Dr. Neha did. And what they found is that the maximum proportion of cases having cerebral edema will present to you at admission. And these cases will generally be treated outside. But as you saw in the previous case, and as Dr. Anjali mentioned, you always have to be prepared for cerebral edema at any point of time. And as you see in the peaks on the left-hand side, the peaks occur at 16 hours, 24 hours, can occur up to 60 hours. So be ready for cerebral edema at any point of time during management. And the other thing is that the major predictors, which we saw were uh, somebody who had a new onset diabetes, because they are often more severely affected and somebody who has received treatment from outside. So I would say three things outside treatment, pH less than 6.9, CO2 less than 10, always be very cautious. And if your GCS is low, I'm really scared this could be cerebral edema and I want to be a bit slow in that perspective. Yes. So the same case, after managing for cerebral edema, does fine. Recovered from uh, comatose state. Blood sugars, again, going on the lower side at 120. PH improving, base excess but still persisting. 
So, Dr. Vikas, anything else that we should consider at this point of time? See, uh, thank you, Dr. Sain. See, what is happening is at 20 hours, the child is hemodynamically stable. Sugar is okay, 190. And base axis is improving, but still it is high. So, what is happening is the acidosis part is persisting. So, we should take, check the ketones. And in this setting, if the ketones are negative, and again with the, with the negative, sir. Huh, so ketones are negative. That means we are not getting uh, ketosis. We have got only acidosis yes, in, a, in a otherwise stabilized child. So we should think about the hypochloremic acidosis. Even we do not have to have the uh, have the electric acidosis, uh, which should be less than 32. So anything, anything, any new protocol uh, should not be done in this case. Just wait and watch. And if if still it is persisting, we can change the fluid from normal saline to lingual lactate. But usually this is a self-limiting condition. And you, but again, you should have very, very close watch on the hemodynamic status of the child and keep waiting. And this will resolve by itself. Yes, sir. The hemodynamics was doing fine. And the chloride load, as you just said, came out to be 38. Okay. So, so again, it's confirmed the diagnosis. Yes. I so need, uh, need to wait and watch at this point of time, sir. And yes. For the yes. Sugars, we'll go ahead with adding 10% dextrose. No, though, this is a, a tricky situation because if you are stopping insulin right now, uh, then the acidosis part will persist. So, and again, on the one hand, you have got hypoglycemia. On the other hand, you have got insulin infusion. So, what is the protocol is, as Dr. Vajpayee has said, you should add the dextrose, keep titrating the blood, your blood sugar, and delay and continue with the insulin infusion till you are overlapping the subcutaneous insulin. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think that's a very important message. Another thing to remember is that now this is 20 hours. So, by this time, we should expect the ketoacidosis to have gone by this time. So I would be going a bit step further, try to maybe add dextrose and reduce insulin also because he's not having a much problem because of ketosis. We reduce the insulin and try to taper. If this is at night, maybe give a long acting insulin right away because this is something which will reduce the duration of overlap and you will have a better outcome coming from there. One parameter which you have mentioned is chloride load, which is an indicator of how much is the chloride. Now, Dr. Sain, how can you prevent hyperchloremic atherosis or what steps can reduce the development of hyperchloremic acid. So we can start with N by 2. So you can start with a half normal yes. saline or you can start with plasma light. You can start with Hartman solution, which has got a lower amount of chloride. You can use potassium phosphate as half correction instead of potassium chloride. We haven't discussed that part because we discussed a lot about potassium. Now, standard guidelines have long said use 50% potassium phosphate, 50% of potassium <coughs> chloride. But in India, potassium phosphate was not easily available. Now we have got potassium phosphate, which is available. So anybody whose pH is below 6.9, we definitely should give it. Otherwise, also you can use 50-50%. You will prevent hypophosphatemia and you will also not cause a lot of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis because this is one condition and often people continue insulin for a long time. It is not needed in this scenario. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vikas. And thank you, Anurag, sir, for this wonderful message. And uh, uh, moving ahead now, Yes. Yeah. So at 28 hours, the base axis has reduced. It has come down to less than minus 5. And blood sugars are 170. The child is conscious. So everything is going fine. So Dr. Hemang, what are the things that we should do now? Should we wait further? Or should we do something else and switch the child to oral uh, feeds? Yes. So uh, child is conscious and uh, sugars are well controlled and acidosis has resolved now. So, at this point of time, we may think to switch to the subcutaneous insulin. Okay. <clears throat> and, and we should allow, allow orally also? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, we started the patient on regular insulin. And uh, well, this is the case I had managed when I just came. I started the patient on regular insulin and I stopped the fluid and insulin immediately. And the sugars after two hours came out to be 560. So, do you think I did something uh, which was uh, not appropriate at this point? Yes, Dr. Sayan. Uh, what uh, we can, uh, we should do is uh, switching to the subcutaneous insulin should be a overlap process. And uh, uh, if we uh, we allow orally, and actually, first thing, switching of the insulin should be done around the time of major meal. Meal should be available. Second thing. Uh, <coughs> Second thing, uh, we should continue fluid and insulin till one hour uh, after we have given subcutaneous insulin. 
and uh, till that time we may just uh, continue low dose insulin so that a uh, smooth overlap of the subcutaneous uh, uh, intravenous to the subcutaneous insulin transition occurs yeah and uh, one more thing uh, which, which uh, anurag sir has mentioned is we may uh, uh, if we think that child is stable enough to switch to the subcutaneous insulin one day prior to that at night uh, we may just give a longer acting insulin so that uh, child have a basal uh, a steady amount of insulin in her, his blood and uh, it will further smoothen the transition from the iv to subcutaneous insulin yeah so two points that you just raised a okay. child stable conscious ph is normal we can give him long acting insulin one day prior and to overlap these are the two messages coming out from uh, what you said dr himang thank you for the same and uh, moving forward now post dk we changed to sliding scale 2 units per kg per day and there was random sugars going low going <laughs> high no control over the same so dr navin do you think i mismanaged this as well Yes, Dr. Sai, because uh, sliding slate is not recommended and it is not wise to give insulin based on the preceding blood sugar level in a child with a type 1 diabetes. Because, and uh, it is very important that we need to start the child on basal bolus regimen rather than uh, using sliding scale for the administration of insulin. And uh, with regards to the dose of uh, basal bolus regimen, because of uh, glucotoxicity and uh, acidosis, the requirements may be very high. It may be even be around 1.5 to 2 units per kg per day. And we also need to counsel the parents uh, regarding the fact that during the initial phase of management, we can have fluctuating blood glucose and uh, there can be a drastic fall in the insulin requirement from 2 units to even less than 0.5. So we need to counsel them regarding the various uh, complications such as uh, hypoglycemia regarding the various uh, warning signs of hypoglycemia and also we need to uh, encourage them regarding the meticulous monitoring which is required in the early phase and uh, we also should uh, educate them regarding the fact that the insulin level requirement will go fall down during the initial phase. Thank you for this message. It is not that uh, as per the textbooks uh, which we followed during our residency, it was mentioned uh, for a 10-year-old girl, 1 to 1.2 would be the requirement. But as you very well mentioned, it can be 1.52. And in this child, we actually gave 2.5 units per kg per day. So why do you think the requirement is high, Dr. Sain, to begin with? So just uh, Dr. Naveen just mentioned, due to the glucotoxicity and the lipotoxicity, the remaining cells don't function and there is a uh, level of resistance. But even if you have no cell functioning, your requirement should be 1. Why is it 2.5? So the uh, insulin recept post-receptor action is difficult. So resistance. Yeah. So there is also resistance as well as deficiency. And within 4 weeks, we expect that there will be a reduction of at least 60 to 70 percent in terms of insulin requirements. So you have to be very cautious in the initial phase to assess in terms of how much insulin is to be given in that regard. So I think that's a very big message that start directly from a basal bolus. In fact, you give a basal right at night. Don't wait at that point of time. And again, wait for at least 30 minutes. That's very important from even the rapid acting insulin and the this thing. If you are giving a short acting, wait up to 45 to 60 minutes for it to start acting in that regards. Otherwise, you will have low and high. Sliding scale is a reactive strategy. It is something which should be actually be stopped, not recommended at all in that regards. So just to get an overview about DKA management, we've already discussed that it has got three phases. The first phase is about hydration. You give 10 ml per kg normal saline. And now the recent guideline, which were just released yesterday by the ISPAD, they talk about giving it over 20 to 30 minutes. And they say that if you have a rapid, uh, somebody has been shock, you can repeat it if required. Very few changes which have been done compared to what we have discussed today. So it's pretty much in sync with the ISPAD 2000 2022 guidelines. The next step, of course, is to correct deficit and maintenance over 48 hours and insulin at 0.1. You can use 0 0.05 unit per kg per hour, especially if there is malnutrition and if there is emaciation. Very importantly, always add potassium unless there is anuria, hyperkalemia or ECG changes. If somebody has hypokalemia at presentation, start right in the hydration phase. If you have a blood sugar below 300, add dextrose. Do not give soda bicarbonate and monitor for cerebral edema. 
Now, this is my favorite site. So always you have to look at in DK, you have to keep a balance in terms of management. If you give too little fluid, you will basically have a dehydration. If you give too much fluid, you will have cerebral edema. If you give too little insulin, you will have a delayed course of correction. But if you give too much insulin, you will have hypokalemia. So I think if somebody has to decide whether you want to have a delayed presentation, some dehydration, some long-term treatment versus having cerebral edema, hypokalemia and death, there is no choice between the two. So the key concept of DKA in this current time is basically go slow, do not have a very rapid correction, less amount of insulin, less amount of fluid in that perspective is what we are recommending in that regards. So I think this was a wonderful discussion and we were able to quickly go through the various aspects. I like to thank uh, Dr. Hemang, Dr. Vikas, uh, Dr. Naveen and Dr. Anjali along with Dr. Sayan for having uh, uh, allowed such a wonderful discussion. We'll see if there are particular questions in that regards. So we've got Dr. Bharani again from UK. He is asking in DK with severe hypokalemia less than 2.5, is there a role of calcium gluconate to reduce cardiac arrhythmias along with potassium correction? So Dr. Hemang, what is your take about giving calcium along with uh, the uh, potassium correction? So the key method, the key question is whether calcium can also have a cardioprotective effect in hypokalemia also, as we already know it is there in hyperkalemia. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, already said that uh, uh, in hyperkalemia, uh, we need to give uh, calcium to as a stabilizing agent. But in case of... Uh, Hypokalemia, I uh, I doubt uh, is there any role of calcium gluconate to stabilize the cardiac membrane. And uh, just correction of potassium will reduce the risk of uh, cardiac arrhythmia. I think the most important thing again here will be the potassium correction, which is a pivotal role. Calcium will not have a huge impact uh, in that regards. Now, another question which has come from Dr. Gayatri is about intubation in DK. So Dr. Vikas, what do you think about when should we consider DK intubation early or late? Late, I think we should avoid intubation because there are some studies which has been categorically proven that intubation will, lead, will trigger the cerebral edema. So now we are going switching more and more towards non-invasive uh, ventilation, if at all it is required. Your so take, Dr. You, if you do an intubation, you have a risk of causing paradoxical CNS acidosis. You may cause worsening. So we should try to defer it as long as possible. So few things which you should not do in DK is not to put a central line, not intubate, and very importantly is that do not give potassium. That is something which you have to avoid. The other important thing to remember is that you have to carefully look at phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium, and that becomes pivotal and very, very important from that perspective. So, uh, uh, this Dr. Vajpayee, yeah? uh, just 30 seconds. Uh, I would like to share one of the very important data from my ICU. Before introduction of this uh, this uh, data, this uh, mobile application of DK management, we have got uh, eight admission, out of which uh, we have got five unfortunate kids, which we are not able to have a favorable prognosis. And since we start, uh, you know, applicable this is mobile app as a mandatory protocol for the first hour, our mortality is uh, almost negligible, and we are able to switch early uh, from subcutaneous so from intravenous to subcutaneous insulin. So from this platform, I can very well say. The validation of this mobile application is very much there and everybody should uh, make a habit for residents and the uh, first uh, protocol caregiver in the ICUs. This is my own ICU setting, sir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Vikas, for this wonderful input. And the reason this app was developed was basically to ensure the first dose should be the correct one. The problem is that if we get a call at night, often the treatment has already started by the time we go there, that there is already a lot of mess which has happened. So the key message is initial correct dose is what is most important. And our app is in sync with the latest guidelines because the changes are very, very minute in that perspective. So Dr. Hemang, I think, deserves a big applause. Yes, 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 yes. And he has done a lot of Three cheers. work Three cheers. along with Mr. Shalab Dikshit, who was involved with regards to the technical part. So I think a big round of applause to Dr. Hemang for doing this. And it's already been sure. validated in our center. And we are looking for a multi centric validation also, which will probably uh, carry forward in that perspective. We are also carrying forward this DK uh, protocol or algorithm as part of the PI one, the, the patient, uh, the person has intelligent EMR. So in app, you can't get a printout. So what will happen is that once you enter the basic data, you will get a full prescription sheet follow-up sheet, monitoring sheet, and it will become much, much easier. So I think that's a wonderful uh, input from Dr. Vikas 
in that regard. So, Dr. Anjali, any experiences that you'd like to share from your <laughs> management of DK? So, Dr. Heman, your messages, key messages? We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, there are well-established protocol for the management of decay, but uh, uh, sticking to the protocol is uh, are at most necessary to reduce the morbidity and mortality. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we may have a bedside tool which is easily accessible and uh, which may prevent, uh, which may help us to prevent uh, uh, complications uh, which can happen during the management of decay. Decay is one of the things if managed nicely as a 0% mortality. So I think we should stick to the protocol. I think that's a big message in the overall <clears throat> theme of our sessions. If we start off with the practical courses that we're doing, the online courses we're doing, and even the application is to really improve the quality of care. That's the main aim. And we want the evidence which is being learned by these courses to be implemented. Because what happens is that if you have learned something, if you don't implement it, it is not a proper use of it. So if you want to have an immediate reminder, these applications are developed in that perspective. So I'd like to thank again, Dr. Vikas, Dr. Hemang, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Anjiri, and Dr. Sain for this wonderful discussion on DK. And we will now move forward towards the last session on hypoglycemia, which is again an important emergency. So we've discussed over the last three hours, it's a long one, and a lot of people are still listening to us continuously. Thank for that. I think audience also deserves a big round of applause. We already discussed the calcium, the electrolyte and DK. We'll now finally go into hypoglycemia, which is a very, very important emergency in that regards. And for this, we also have got experts from across different regions. We've got Dr. Mudita Dhingra, who is from uh, Kurukshetra. She did training under Dr. Sudha Rao in Mumbai. Vijay Wadia, very active in a lot of uh, academic circles as well as the work especially with regards to type 1 diabetes uh, and obesity in the region of Kurukshetra. Dr. Deepak, who was actually my junior at Ames, he was doing his MD there and now is currently in the Janki Medical College, Janakpur, very active again in that part of uh, southern Nepal. Dr. Chetan, who was uh, a fellow here, our first fellows, Dr. Chetan and Dr. Neha, he is uh, currently working as a pediatric endocrinologist in Rajkot. Dr. Rajiv Bansal, a very senior pediatrician from Jaipur, who is of keen interest in quality improvement and to develop more skills and knowledge among young people. We will be joined by Dr. Vibha as well, who will continue with the case scenario. So before we go on to that, we need to understand why do we need glucose? So the body has multiple energy sources. The major areas which guzzle up or eat up energy is the brain. So when you are listening to all these talks or when you are preparing for examination, your brain is eating up all your glucose. The other areas are the heart, which is continuously pumping and the muscles. So for that and the RBCs, of course, because they're doing a lot of work. Glucose is a tool which can be used by anybody. Any of these organs will utilize glucose, whether it is blood cells, whether it is brain, whether it is the heart or the muscle. Ketone is an alternate source of energy, which is used predominantly by the brain and also by the muscle. So if you have less glucose and you have ketone, you will be fine. So situation, and we'll always talk about ketotic versus non-ketotic. So if you have a ketotic hypoglycemia, the brain will be preserved more compared to a non-ketotic hypoglycemia. So hyperinsulinism will cause much more brain damage than glycogen storage disease. You will have children with GSD who have a sugar of 20, 30, they will stand there in front of you. While if you have hyperinsulinism, if they have a sugar of 20, 30, they have no alternate sources. They will be really in a very, very bad scenario in that regards. Now, fatty acid can also be utilized by the heart. So again, becomes important. Since a lot of hypoglycemia happens in the neonatal period, we need to understand the perinatal physiology. So we know that mother is the major source of glucose to the baby. All the glucose that baby has comes from the mother. It has no intrinsic production. So this glucose is basically a passive transport using GLUT1 and 3. And typically, the baby's glucose are around 80% of mother's levels. But baby is very, very effective in getting glucose from the mother because this is what actually determines its growth. So what happens is that insulin can, of course, not cross the placenta. But the placental hormones like human placental lactogen, they induce insulin resistance. That is why a lot of women develop gestational diabetes. So anyway, Increase in glucose is a normal phenomena during pregnancy. 
Now, this glucose will go up, so baby will get more amount of glucose. If you have got more glucose and you are not using anywhere because baby doesn't need to use that glucose now, it is of course going to increase insulin and inhibit glucagon. Increase insulin, low glucagon is an anabolic state. So fetus is basically just the only work of the fetus is to grow. So it is extracting glucose from the mother and causing fetal growth and causing glycogen deposition which can be used later on when it is required which is the postnatal period. Now maximum of this happens in the third trimester. Now as soon as the birth happens, there is a cut in this supply. So this supply goes down. So what is to be done? We have to use the resources which are available. So for this, epinephrine will go up, insulin will come down and glucagon will go up. So essentially, you will have a lot of glycogenolysis which will happen, gluconeogenesis and a bit of lipolysis. Remember, ketogenesis is not effective in the first 24 hours. So if you measure ketones in the first 24 hours, everybody will be hypoketotic. So what I'm trying to say that first 48 hours, anyway, don't worry in terms of evaluation. So any neonate will have a fall, a dip in the glucose level. Maximum dip happens by around two hours. And after 48 hours, the metabolism, they become like adult. At 48 hours, a newborn's metabolism is just like an adult. The dip is greater for preterm neonates. And this has implications why they have much more likelihood of having hypoglycemia in that perspective. So this brings us to how do we define hypoglycemia in the newborn period. Now, if you want to define hypoglycemia, you need Whipple's triad. You need to have symptoms of hypoglycemia. You need to have low glucose. And this should not improve with, basically, this should improve once you give a correction with regards to the treatment, which happens with regards to the glucose. But in babies, you may not have all those symptoms which are there. So we use operational thresholds, which means when should we start worrying? So even if you are asymptomatic, and glucose is below 25 in the first 4 hours, 35 between 4 to 24 hours, 50, 24 to 48 hours, and less than 60 beyond that, you have to worry. But if you have hypoglycemic seizures and your glucose is slightly higher, it doesn't mean that you don't need to worry. You have to worry also in that scenario. So when should you evaluate? If the hypoglycemia is persistent beyond 48 hours, you are needing a lot of glucose requirement, or there is no risk factor which is there in that perspective. You need to then evaluate for the cause of hypoglycemia, which becomes important in that perspective. Remember, glucometers are unreliable at low levels. So get a lab correction, which is very important in that regards. If you keep the sample in there and the, the orderly forgets about that, you will have low sugars because you will be eating up. The RBCs will eat up that. Similarly, if somebody has polycythemia, there will be a pseudo-hypoglycemia which may happen. Be wary about that. Now, hypoglycemia theoretically can be because of a problem in either the glycogen metabolism or storage, problems in gluconeogenesis or ketogenesis. And there are basically four groups of hormones which act. We have got one which is causing hypoglycemia, which is insulin. And the counter-regulatory hormones are glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine, and growth hormone. So while insulin excess can cause hypoglycemia, deficiency of a single counter-regulatory hormone will not cause because there is redundancy. So when you have hypoglycemia, you are talking about multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, which is going to cause that in that scenario. So if you have hyperinsulinism, insulin will cause hypoglycemia, but your glucose requirement will be high but there will be no ketones. That is a very important thing to remember. If on the other hand, you have a cortisol deficiency, you will have ketotic hypoglycemia with hyponatremia. A problem in the glycogen metabolism, glycogen storage disease will not present right at birth because child is feeding every two to four hours. They will present after six months of age with hepatomegaly, renomegaly, ketotic hypoglycemia, lactic acidosis. That is a typical presentation. A gluconeogenic defect will present even later with predominantly lactic acidosis. A problem if you have in growth hormone or multiple pituitary hormone deficiency will present to you with other features like micropenis, midline defects. And if your ketone levels, you have a problem in ketones, you will have episodic hypoketotic hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia can be because of decreased production in which your glucose requirements are low 
or increased utilization where your glucose requirements are more supraphysiological, more than 12 milligram per kg per minute. Decreased production could be a substrate issue like prematurity or SCA. Metabolic defects can be endocrine in which you will have micropenis, midline defect, left lift, left palate or metabolic defects like galactosemia or fatty acid oxidation defect. Galactosemia, you will have cataract, which is an important message in that regards. If there is an increased utilization, you may have a sepsis or a cardiac failure or hyperinsulinism. Hyperinsulinism typically will have a non-ketotic form of hypoglycemia. This could be transient, most commonly because of infant or diabetic mother, which resolves in one to two weeks. Prolonged typically happening with a SGA baby. So SGA, birth asphyxia, prolonged for two to six weeks. And you have then rarer causes like genetic causes in which you can have severe forms because of potassium ATP channel defects and milder forms. So overall, if you ask me what are the most common persistent causes of hypoglycemia, it is hyperinsulinism, which you have to worry because this is causing severe damage. Your requirement is high. You need to evaluate and manage. And in hyperinsulinism, the most common is prolonged hyperinsulinism. So if your birth weight is low, think of prolonged hyperinsulinism. If there is macrosomia, early onset, think of infant or diabetic mother. Macrosomia and persistent beyond two weeks or one week, think of a potassium ATP channel defect in that regards. And you require that. So if an individual becomes hypoglycemic, you should definitely be have zero insulin. There should be a ketone which is significantly present. Cortisol should be above 550. Often we just compare to a normal range, but it is not normal. It has to be appropriately elevated. And you expect the growth hormone to be high. So all this you need to remember when you assess a critical sample. So the most important thing to do in a child with hypoglycemia is to check the critical sample. Most important is ketone, cortisol, insulin, maybe growth hormone, lactate. This will be something which will be important in that perspective. So if you have any detectable insulin during hypoglycemia, this is hyperinsulinism. If ketone is low, everybody who is hypoglycemic should be ketotic. The most important investigation in hypoglycemia is ketone. If your ketone is low, think of fatty acid oxidation defect, galactosemia or gold abnormalities in there. If your lactate is high, it is glycogen storage disease or a gluconeogenic defect. If cortisol is low, think of MPHD in that regards. So ketone is very important. If your ketone is less than 0.6, it is hyperinsulinism or galactosemia. Do a urine reducing substance and an insulin level. If ketone is mildly elevated, it can be a fatty acid oxidation defect. You look at acyl carnitine profile and genetic study. If ketone is more, a lot of workup needs to be done here. Look at uh, organic acidemia, accelerated starvation, reducing substance, insulin, all those things might need to be done in that scenario. Now, often people say we don't have blood ketones. Can we use urine ketones? For DK, the answer is no. But here you can because here you want to know whether it is there or not. And urine ketone may be there for a longer time. So maybe you have corrected the hypoglycemia, but still urine ketone may be positive. So if you have a confusion, you can also check urine ketone in that perspective. Finally, if your ketone is low, think of hyperinsulinism and fatty acid oxygen defect. If your lactate is high, think of a GSD1 or gluconeogenic defect. If there is acidosis, again, the same scenario with organic acidemia. Insulin, anybody with detectable insulin is hyperinsulinism and rarely you will require a glucagon test. So the most important tests are ketone, lactate and insulin, along with, of course, cortisol, which will give you an appropriate picture. If you have persistent hypoglycemia, your cortisol levels in stores may be exhausted. So you may find that somebody who has high glucose insulin requirement, high GIR, insulin is high, ketone is negative, but cortisol is also low. This is because of an exhaustion response. And don't get confused that this is actually a cortisol deficiency in this scenario. So just look at ketone. If the ketone is low or absent, look at reducing substance. If it's positive, it is galactosemia or fructose intolerance, negative. Look at insulin levels. If they are undetectable fatty acid oxygen defect, if they're detectable hyperinsulinism. If ketone is high, look at lactate. If lactate is high, it is GSD1 or gluconeogenic defect. If it's normal with organomegaly, this is rare forms of GSD. 
if there is no organomegaly, look at cortisol and GH, and then you diagnose. So look at ketone, look at lactate, look at organomegaly, you will get the diagnosis there. Finally, about hyper. We in hyperinsulinism is hyperinsulinism. <coughs> Stream is not coming, I think. Yes, it is stopped for me also. So, yes, the key points which uh, Sir uh, is discussing is that we have to look for the ketones, the lactate, and organomegaly. So, we'll soon discuss the cases, and with that, we'll understand this concept very well. So we'll wait for sir to come back. Uh, yeah, so sorry for the error. In between, there was some issue with regards to the uh, overall uh, connection. So we'll just continue from that. We were discussing about the final approach of hyperinsulinism. And what we decided was that you have to look at many other factors before you just go ahead with hyperinsulinism in that regards. And it's that you have got less amount of sensitivity for a detectable insulin. Look at other parameters also in that regard. So hypokalemia and a high GI are also indicators of hyperinsulinism. So in hyperinsulinism, first exclude transient and prolonged forms. If they are there, treat with dextrose and dioxide. If they are not there, look at dioxide response. If it is present, you continue dioxide, look at ammonia, which may give you an indication for a form, genetic form, which we'll discuss in a case also. If that is not there, go for potassium ATP channel defects, if there is a recessive defect, then you can go for a, a, a palliative surgery because it's a permanent form usually. If it's a paternal uh, abnormality, you can go for a focal form and evaluate from that in that perspective. So we have discussed about the various causes, pathophysiology and assessment with regards to that. We'll now move forward towards the case scenarios. Dr. Vibha, you probably will please continue. Thank you so much, sir. We have this six-hour boy and uh, we got a call from NICU because uh, his blood sugar was 36. So Dr. Modeta, what yes. would you like to do in this case? Uh, yes, yes. Could we go for the uh, extensive evaluation in this case? Yeah, good evening everyone. So this is a six hour old uh, newborn baby with a blood glucose level of 36 milligram per deciliter. Yes. So as we know that hypoglycemia is very common in newborns and it can have a devastating effects regarding to the neurodevelopmental outcome. But we need to be careful in diagnosis of hypoglycemia. Right. So as Sir explained it uh, very well that uh, there is a transitional phase from uh, till around 48 hours uh, when the glucose regulatory machine is still developing. And there is a physiological dip in blood glucose level both in the term and preterm babies. So this physiological dip uh, is normal and in this child, uh, the child is only, baby is only six hour old with a blood glucose level of 36 milligram per deciliter and baby is asymptomatic. 
so right. i think this baby doesn't need any evaluation and uh, just requires a uh, frequent feeding uh, very well said ma'am what key messages would you like to give so yes uh, so just i just said and that the, uh, not... yes ma'am and when yes. would uh, when we should evaluate in the cases like uh, when we got a call from the nicu for hypoglycemia yes so whenever we get a call for hypoglycemia to nicu we have to uh look into the details of the history whether the baby was preterm term post term or uh, whether there is any risk factor for example birth asphyxia whether the baby was sga right. whether the mother had gestational diabetes or any drugs so all these uh, history we have to take in detail and then only evaluate a baby with hypoglycemia and as as i said that uh, the transitional phase uh, last for around 48 hours so any hypoglycemia which persists beyond 48 hours requires investigation right another indication would be the gir requirement of more than 12 mg per kg per minute so as we know that the glucose output by the uh, uh, liver is uh, at the rate of around 4 to 6 mg per kg per minute yes. and uh, whenever there is substrate deficiency or endocrine deficiency the uh, you know whenever we replace iv fluids with a gir of 6 to 8 mg per kg per minute it suffices but whenever the gir requirement is very high it requires detailed investigation so all these cases will require investigation if there is any risk factor is the, if the hypoglycemia persists uh, beyond 48 hours and if the gir requirement is more than 12 mg per kg per minute okay thank you ma'am so any key messages ma'am so yeah this baby uh, need uh, didn't need any evaluation because this baby is asymptomatic without any risk factors and the blood glucose is 36 mg per deciliter at 6 hours of life so thank you when so we much consider so. yeah yeah thank you so this is only transitional hypoglycemia so thank you so much ma'am now moving towards the next case we have this uh, three week old boy <coughs> and we got a reference call from the nic because he was having seizures and his uh, blood sugar was just 28 and we when we examined the child he had micropenis also so dr deepak okay so this neonate is already has already passed the transitional phase and now he is having symptomatic seizure along with the visible micropenis so immediately our mind should think about whether this child is having some pituitary issues like multiple pituitary hormone deficiency so we should examine this newborn in detail for such features like uh, central in uh, single incisors cleft palate nystagmus or any other stigmata which suggest this uh, new need can have multiple pituitary deficiency right. besides that we can take the help of our lab also so may i know what is the lab value for investigation in this newborn so what investigation we should order for first investigation oh. what investigation we so should first order? first we have to identify whether this child is having ketotic hypoglycemia or non ketotic hypoglycemia so ketone okay. will be the first because okay. this child is also having seizures so electrolyte calcium magnesium will be also prudent okay. in this case the ketones were 2.3 it was greater than 2 so it was so it's 2.3 so in a way it rules out hyperinsulinism so our aim should be to evaluate whether this newborn is having gsd or some other illness but because this newborn is having micropenis so straight away we can think of some pituitary issue so we have to identify like and so when we further evaluate the child and we found that sodium is also on the lower side it is just 128 and the lactate is 1.2 which is the normal okay. level so i guess this child doesn't have any organomegaly too so straight away this child is having hyponatremia with normal potassium suggesting cortisol issue along with hypoglycemia so probably this newborn is having multiple pituitary hormone deficiency so yes, we have sir. to measure the function of pituitary yes sir when we get the cortisol levels <laughs> they were quite low it was just 125 and growth hormone was 4 nanogram per m. So you were right it was the case of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency so so what key messages would you like to give from this case so in any newborn who is having hypoglycemia which is prolonged we have to rule out certain 
key uh, problems like hyperinsulinism, multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, and some inborn error of metabolism. So like in this case, there is glaring micropenis. So we should not forget to examine this newborn for signs of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency like micropenis, cleft palate, nystagmus, single incisor. And, and a big message was that the cortisol level was reported as not very low. And the growth hormone was also reported as normal. But we need to understand that this is inappropriately low for the level of hypoglycemia. So that is another big message we have to consider. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Deepak, for this uh, wonderful you. message. So moving towards the next case. Uh, we have this 10-year-old girl, 10, sorry, 10-day-old girl uh, with the hypoglycemia. Uh, but the, the glucose requirement was high. That is 14 milligram per kg per minute on uh, the undetectable ketone. And uh, the urine-reducing substance was negative. So Dr. Chetan, uh, are you there? Dr. Chetan? So if he's not around, I can take that. Okay, sir. Sir, could you please, Dr. Deepak, uh, please help me with this case. How should we proceed uh, in this case, sir? Okay, so this again, unit is having uh, hypoglycemia, which is prolonged beyond the transitional right. phase uh, with hypoketotism and high glucose infusion rate beyond right. 12 milligram per minute, per kg per minute. So indirectly, it tells us this child or neonate is having features of hyperinsulinism. So we can may uh, examine him for such things like uh, in hairy pina, increase in the pina, umphalo seal, or some other features of hyperinsulinism. Right, sir. So was there anything like that, suggesting yeah. something like uh, that? Sir, so there was, a, the examination has some uh, features of a hairy pinna. And when we get the insulin levels done, uh, it was uh, three mil, uh, it was in the normal range. Okay, so basically whenever the glucose is low, along with high glucose infusion rate, there is no business of insulin to be there in the blood. Right. So it tells us this child is having hyperinsulinism. Though this is reported normal, but this is inappropriately normal. It yes, should sir. not be there. So this yes. child is having hyperinsulinism. So, uh, sir, in this case, we did the glucose response. As sir already mentioned that uh, the sensitivity of glucose response is 100%. So, specificity of glucose response is 100%. So, we did the glucose response and uh, uh, there was a rise in the glu uh, this glucose. So, what would you like to give us a message from this case? So the message is whenever the high glucose infusion rate is uh, uh, there in any newborn, we should always think of hyperinsulinism and we have to work, of, work for that because there is treatment available either in form of drug or if it is prolonged, we have to go for uh, pancreatic evaluation whether it needs resection or some other form of treatment. So investigation like insulin, C-peptide, ketone. So we have to take the critical sample at the time of hypoglycemia and based right. on our clinical diagnosis, we can ask the lab to uh, give the report. Uh, rightly said, sir. Uh, what key messages would you like to give from this case, sir? So, because this child is having hyper uh, uh, hypoglycemia with high glucose infusion rate and ketone was negative, so this child is having hyperinsulinism and we have to think of that because if we miss that, long-term outcome will be very bad in this case of in, in this kind of scenario because of repeated hypoglycemia and brain damage. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this uh, wonderful message. Okay. So I think this is a very important scenario of hyperinsulinism, which is a common scenario in which there can be so much confusion which is there. And that really causes uh, often a issue which can cause a particular uh, scenario and if we do not have an appropriate evaluation at that point of time, these conditions will have a very, very uh, adverse effect because there is a very limited time which will happen in terms of the overall uh, progress and that is uh, important from that perspective. So hyperinsulinism clearly, if you have a high GIR, think of hyperinsulinism and then we'll go forward from the other scenario. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we have an next case. Uh, this is a six-day-old girl, and again with a hypoglycemia. Uh, her birth weight, birth weight was three point four kg. 
and uh, this uh, very low ketone and uh, the glucose requirement was high that is that was 12 milligram per kg per minute and on the urine there was no reducing substance found and uh, the insulin was detectable and um, what we found that the growth hormone and the cortisol was also low in this case. So uh, I was not able to conclude this case. So Dr. Rajiv, could you help me with this case? Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, this is an interesting patient uh, and almost similar to the one which we had discussed earlier. But the important thing to note in this child is the low growth hormone levels and cortisol levels of 120. Ideally, in a normal setting, when there is hypoglycemia, there should be an exaggerated response with cortisol and growth hormone. To, to, so uh, the, it seems that to be very sure that this is because of hyperinsulinemia, we do we have to do a gluca glucagon challenge test with 30 microgram per kg of glucagon. If, if there is a response with increased in glu glucose levels, that suggests that it's because of per se because of hyperinsulinemia. But why growth hormone levels in cortisol are low? It seems that there is an exhaustion of the stores of cortisol and growth hormone because of there is an appropriate glucagon response. It seems there is because of this exhaustion, the levels of cortisol and growth hormones are low. So this is uh, this is an important condition and one should not be misguided if the cortisol levels are low. Yes, sir. we done the we, uh, glucon res glucagon response and it was uh, present. There was a rise in the blood glucose. So as you have correctly mentioned, yeah, this was the case of hyperinsulinism, not the multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. So yeah. sir, what key messages would you like to mention here? So the key messages are that high glucose infusion rate suggests hyperinsulinism and cortisol exertion with prolonged disease can occur and one should not go in, one should always measure and see to it that is, is that multiple endocrine uh, defects should be seen like central midline defects should also be observed before we come to a conclusion for those conditions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. As sir has already mentioned and doctor has already mentioned by the Dr. Rajiv that uh, if we are dealing with a patient with uh, hyperinsulinism and we also have low cortisol and the low growth hormone levels, so it could be the cause uh, due to the cortisol exhaustion and we should go for the glucagon response to confirm the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. So and now moving towards the next case, we have this two-day-old girl. Uh, uh, who was admitted in NICU and she had uh, episodes of seizures. When the blood glucose was measured, it was just 24. And the ketones were very undetectable. There was no reducing substance in the urine and there was detectable insulin. So, Dr. Deepak, uh, how, would you, uh, how should we approach these cases in NICU? Okay, so because this newborn is still only two days, so ketone value probably may not be having so great importance, but this newborn is having seizure along with hypoglycemia, but insulin is there, so it suggests some form of hyperinsulinism is there. So we have to go into the history, whether this mother had RS negative blood group, PIH or eclampsia, or there was some HIE life of scenario or right, there sir. was some diabetes in the mother. So can you give some? Yes, tips? sir. Uh, mother has a diabetes and yeah. the birth weight uh, of the baby was 4.4 kg. So it was... So, uh, and what was the glycosylated hemoglobin lady? Uh, sir, it was 8. Okay. So it tells us this mother had uh, pregnancy-related diabetes. So probably this baby is, having, is infant of diabetic mother with hyperinsulinism. So it need to be monitored and managed like hyperinsulinism. Right, sir. And so what examination, uh, what important point should we uh, do in the examination while examining the baby? Okay, so this baby will have normal head circumference with big broad shoulder with hairy pinna and uh, there will be polycythemia like of uh, chubby looking baby and maybe some hepatomegaly too. Okay. Uh, so, what uh, uh, this key messages would you like to give here? So, any newborn who is having hypoglycemia again need to be taken care regarding 
uh, different etiology, particularly looking towards the endocrine aspect, we have to think about hyperinsulinism and we have to go systematically with the history. If it suggests, we have to go for the workup of hyperinsulinism, including ketone, insulin, or C peptide levels. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so it is very important to ask for the maternal history in the patient, in the baby of uh, hyperinsulinism, if the birth weight of the baby is uh, like uh, this, in this case, uh, more than 3 kg. So never miss to take the maternal history um, and never miss to <coughs> carry the baby properly. So thank you so much, Dr. Deepak. Now moving towards the next case, we have this 14-day-old boy and uh, he has a history of birth asphyxia during the birth and uh, so he was admitted in the NICU for this. Uh, the blood sugar uh, was 28, so we got a referral for this. Uh, he was the glucose requirement of this baby was high. It was 40 milligram per kg per minute, and uh, the ketone was undetectable. But there was a detectable insulin. It was 4.2, and but as we have seen in all previous cases, when we have detectable insulin like hyperinsulinism, the birth we expect the birth weight to be high, like uh, uh, more than 3 kg. But in this case, it is just 1.6 kg. So I'm not getting with this case. So Dr. Mojeda, could you help me uh, in this case? What would be the cause of this? Uh, uh, is this birth asphyxia and this low birth weight and this hyperinsulinism all are related? Yes. So we'll see all the uh, things step by step. The first point is uh, the age of the newborn. The right. baby is 14 day old. So the baby is out of the transition period of uh, right. the transitional phase of adaptation. And the baby has already two risk factors, the birth asphyxia. And the second is the birth weight of the baby. So right. he is clearly SGA baby with history of birth asphyxia. Then the next step is the GIR requirement. Right. So uh, as I already explained that the GIR requirement, if the substrate requirement is high, uh, or there is increased utilization of glucose, uh, by increased insulin level, only then the GI requirement is so high. So this baby has clearly uh, hyperinsulinism. That is why the baby is required, requiring such high GIR. And there are two risk factors for that, birth asphyxia and uh, the SGA baby. So what happens typically in uh, these babies is there is prolonged or prolonged hyperinsulinism. So hyperinsulinism, when we talk about, they are of three types. The one is transitional, which usually happens in a newborn baby uh, whose mother has gestational uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, then uh, uh, prolonged happens in these babies, for example, with birth asphyxia or SGA baby or Beck with, with men's syndrome. And this hyperinsulinism usually lasts uh, till around six to eight weeks. And then there is persistent forms of hyperinsulinism, uh, which have genetic mutations as a cause. So this is a baby with prolonged hyperinsulinism and these babies need to be started on treatment. Otherwise, uh, the developmental outcome will be bad in these babies. So we'll start this baby with a diazoxide tablet and then see how the baby responds. I think we again lost the connection. Yeah, it seems so. Yeah, yeah, it disconnected from the uh, Anurag sir side. Yeah. So the newborn which uh, we are discussing here is uh, SGA baby with birth asphyxia with prolonged hyperinsulinism, and it is very common scenario, especially in India, uh, where we have a lot of uh, load of SGA babies. So hyperinsulinism is very common, and usually. Whenever it persists beyond 48 hours, we have to act and start diazoxide tablet. So I will be starting diazoxide treatment in this baby, and then we'll see the response. Many neonatologists or a new passers think SGA baby have hypoglycemia because of low substrate or decrease in the liver stone. But we have to understand these baby also have hyperinsulinism and have to investigate yes. it in life. 
Yes, usually these babies. So the GIR requirement will tell us the answer. If the GIR requirement is very high, that means there could be a component of hyperinsulinism. Otherwise, if GIR requirement is six to eight milligram per deciliter, that could be because of substrate deficiency, which can also happen in SGA babies. So GIR requirement will guide us the treatment, and then we need to check the insulin level in the critical sample. So it is very important to check the critical sample. of management how should we treat these babies yeah so i will be starting this uh, baby on a diazoxide tablet and then see the response so i think this is a very very important scenario because now prolonged hyperinsulinism is by far one of the most important causes we are seeing and they will respond to diazoxide this is a very important message at this point of time and now what happened on follow up dr viba and on uh, as mark has already mentioned then we started that diazoxide with a 10 mg per kg per minute and so the glucose requirement has decreased but the baby has developed edema so doctor um, dr chetan yeah hello good evening everybody and thank you dr anurag and the team good evening sir sir uh, yeah. uh, so could you please explain what is the cause of this developing edema in this baby when we started diazoxide yeah so this is was a case of clear cut hyperinsulinism which responded to moderate dose of diazoxide as well the usual dose of diazoxide is 5 to 15 usually we start with the 10 but a non effect or we can say adverse effect of the diazoxide is fluid overload so right. definitely this looks like uh, this edema is due to the diazoxide itself so it has been said in the guideline as well that along with the diazoxide uh, we should use the uh, diuretic that is hydrochlorothiazide and another is we should not use uh, any other uh, diuretics like furosemide and all due to the risk of hypokalemia so along with the diazoxide we can use a minor dose of hydrochlorothiazide as well right sir sir as you have already said we started the thiazide for this edema and the edema has reduced so and so uh, how should we taper it uh, for how long like uh, it should be gradual taper or it should we should uh, suddenly yeah, stop the it should be always gradually uh, tapered uh, even uh, we used to give advice to the patient that uh, even they should be uh, checking the blood sugar at home as well preferably 3 to 4 times a day uh, whenever the sugar goes above 100 or remains persistent above 100 we can uh, decrease maybe 1 mg per kg per day uh, every few days so it can be tapered over 2 to 3 months usually most the uh, most of the temporary hyperinsulinism responds by 8 to 12 weeks of the uh, therapy so yes it should be gradual along with the sugar management and uh, the parents or the relative should be meant uh, ex, ex, uh, explained regarding the management of hypoglycemia if at all occurs and we should give them a target of at least 70 mg per deciliter of the rbs uh thank uh, so what key messages would you like to give here and what other with what side effects the patient should be aware of the diazoxide can cause in the baby the most important diazoxide is uh, most important side effect is uh, as uh, this case uh, is undergoing that is edema and weight gain uh, another a uh, few less common side effects are hypertrichosis as well as uh, low platelet as well so any 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 unexplained bleeding or, or blood in stool uh, should be uh, directly or uh, managed on a emergency basis so this was a case of prolonged hyperinsulinism which can occur with the sga baby uh, diazoxide is the first line of management but again i would say that uh, before starting diazoxide a normal 2d echo is must because uh, we have encountered many cases which are on air maintaining spo2 but whenever we start the diazoxide this minor pphn or or pah gets aggravated so definitely 2d echo should be done before starting diazoxide diazoxide we can start in the moderate dose say approximately 10 to 12 mg per kg per day in 2 to 3 divided doses we should be monitor for the side effect particularly the weight gain in edema and exactly. uh, uh, we should always use uh, hydrochlorothiazide along with the disoxide uh, thank you so much sir uh, now moving towards the next case we have this 15 day girl again with a hypoglycemia and uh, her birth weight was 3.2 kg 
and again her this glucose requirement was high 40 mg per kg per minute and uh, this very undetectable ketone hypoketotic uh, the detectable insulin so uh, dr rajiv what was the uh, lactate levels uh, urine sir, uh, sorry uh, what are the urine reducing substance so yeah what? let me come to this uh, yeah was it normal or uh, it was negative? Uh, sorry, it was negative. Uh, it, was, sir, it was negative. Okay. So if you have a, a urine uh, reducing substance negative with hyperinsulinemia and uh, the ketones are low, you are left with only one diagnosis that is hyperinsulinism. And uh, with hyperinsulinism, the treatment as we had already discussed is the treatment with digoxide. And if this patient responds with digoxide, that, that means that we have a VPC that it excludes a dioxide response excludes almost all causes of severe congenital hyperinsulinism. And uh, one, but in all these cases, one need to do ammonia levels because uh, yes, sometimes we get uh, uh, some mildly raised ammonia levels of the tune of 80 to 150 or 160 uh, moles per liter. And if the ammonia levels are high, that suggests that the patient might be having HIHA syndrome. So yes, this has sir. always to be excluded in these patients. Uh, yes, sir. when we get the ammonia levels done and it was high in this case. So uh, you have already mentioned ki it could be the, yeah, it is the cause of uh, HIHA. So, sir, uh, what are the key messages? Would you like the key to hear? message is that the digoxin, digoxide response is key to the diagnosis of uh, the underlying cause of hyperinsulinemia, and one should always uh, measure ammonia levels, which will which are uh, invariably in a mild form. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful message. Now, coming to the next case. Now, uh, we have this six-month boy. Uh, he come to us with lethargy uh, and blood sugar was 36. The parents uh, brought him to the OPD. So, Dr. Mudita, uh, what could be the cause of this suddenly low blood sugar in the six-month-old boy? Yes. So, as now we are moving towards beyond neonatal age group and this baby is an infant, six-month-old with hypoglycemia and the baby is symptomatic. So right. we need to understand the physiology first. So uh, whenever the mechanism of glycogenolysis, uh, gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis are intact, the baby can uh, tolerate uh, fasting of around 6 to 12 hours. But in this case, uh, you know, when the ba uh, baby has already developed hypoglycemia at 6 months of age. So the first step in investigation would be the ketones. And right. uh, are the ketones present or absent in this baby? Yes, ma'am. Ketones are present. Yes. So, this is ketotic hypoglycemia. And the next step to evaluate is the serum lactate level, which they is also high. very high. Which is yes. also very high. So, it points towards the diagnosis of glycogen storage disorder. And this uh, baby already uh, also has hepatomegaly. So, right. as the name suggests, it is glycogen storage disorder. So, glycogen is deposited in organs like liver and muscles and it is uh, not released uh, uh, in the form of glucose in the bloodstream. So uh, there is defective glycogenolysis in these children and hence they develop hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia. So then what are the key messages here? So yes, uh, whenever a baby presents uh, with hypoglycemia beyond neonatal age group at around six months of age or in infancy, and there is presence of uh, high lactate, high ketones, and hepatomegaly. Uh, it points towards the diagnosis of glycogen storage disorder. And uh, we will manage these children with frequent feeding. And maybe some children might require nighttime nasogastric feeding or uh, added cornstarch in the feed. So they will not tolerate prolonged uh, hypoglycemia or prolonged feed gap. Thank you so much, ma'am. So now we have a next case. We have this six week boy uh, who came to us with failure to thrive. He was not gaining weight and uh, his blood sugar was 60 uh, with the normal glucose requirement. He has hepatomegaly. So Dr. Deepak, are we, are, is this case is similar to the previous case? 
No, the age group is slightly different, and here the hepatomegaly is also significant. So this tells us this newborn or infant is having some form of inborn era of metabolism relating to liver. Uh, we have to examine for that and investigate for that. So uh, what is the sir, ketone level? So ketones were low. Okay, so now this child is having uh, hypoketotic hypoglycemia. So we have to uh, decide whether this child is having hyperinsulinism. So it doesn't seem to that because of the physiological glucose requirement. So we are left only with the galactosemia-like issues. So what is the urine-reducing sugar? Uh, they were present in the urine. Okay, so it is uh, probably galactosemia, I think. So what, so what key messages would you like to give here? So hypoglycemia, either in neonate or beyond neonatal period, it's abnormal. It has to be investigated because there are plenty of treatable causes. We have to find out the cause. Otherwise, if you just treat symptomatically with glucose or glucose infusion in the NICU and do not investigate, many cases will go unrecognized and will have devastating consequences. Thank you so much, sir. Moving towards the next case, we have this one-year-old girl and the parents were really scared that uh, she was not waking up in the morning. Uh, when they checked the, her blood sugar, it was just 24. And uh, when we examined the girl, uh, there was no hepatomegaly. So, Dr. Chetan, uh, could you please explain us what's going wrong with this girl? First of all, uh... This is a big boy, a big girl. Uh, she is one year old. So yes. definitely we should be taking history regarding what uh, she has taken in diet uh, the day before the event happened. Whether uh, she was ill or not, she had taken proper dinner or not. And now if we come to the actual case scenario, so definitely this is a hypoglycemia in a one year old girl. So which is always significant. Yes with no hepatomegaly. So as our algorithm suggested, first we should be measuring ketones, whether uh, it is hypoketotic or ketotic. So we know that the ketones hypoketotic are hypoglycemia are three causes, which is generally don't present at this age. Or, uh, at this age. So can you tell me the ketones? Yeah, so ketone were 3.3. So, so definitely... Were present. They were 3.3, yes, sir. Yes. So lactate is normal. So all metabolic disorders are yes, out uh, with the ketotic hypoglycemia. So we have now few diagnoses that is endocrine deficiency in form of hypopituitarism versus accelerated starvation or idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia. So we should be uh, analyzing the cortisol as well as growth hormone from the critical sample to get the next clue. And so when we get the cortisol and the growth hormone levels, they were in the normal range. So cortisol and growth hormone were high at the time of hypoglycemia, suggestive of endocrine sufficiency. So there is no issue regarding the uh, any uh, of this hormone deficiency leading to the last diagnosis that is accelerated starvation. But let me tell you that this is the diagnosis of exclusion. One should not jump on the uh, accelerated starvation just based on the early morning hypoglycemia, uh, symptomatic hypoglycemia. We should be evaluating in terms of ketone lactate growth hormone and cortisol as well. And then we can stem the diagnosis of accelerated starvation. So how could we prevent this accelerated starvation? In yeah. one so if it is a case of accelerated starvation, uh, which is generally present in the uh, failure to thrive or we can say growth failure uh, children. So we should be focusing on nutrition, building up of on nutrition will be the key. So maybe some protein diet as well. Uh, asking the parents not uh, to leave the child uh, more than six hours of fasting at any time, uh, preferably giving cornstarch diet that will release slowly carbohydrates during the night, maybe a bedtime milk or bedtime snack before going to bed, as well as this kind of babies, whenever they feel sick, they are tend to get hypoglycemia. So prompt treatment of the sickness, maybe uh, frequent ORS and, and frequent carbohydrate-related uh, diet as well as liquids, this all uh, will prevent the symptomatic hypoglycemia. Okay. So what key messages would you like to give here? So key message again, ketotic hypoglycemia. Uh, we should be doing all investigation before labeling them as accelerated starvation, particularly endocrine deficiency. And if the child is having short stature with maybe a normal weight, 
or there is midline defect, then we should be definitely looking for the cause of hypopituitarism. So growth hormone cortisol are the key investigations in the ketotic hypoglycemia. Uh, thank you so much, sir, this, for this wonderful message. Now moving towards the next case, uh, we have this uh, two-year-old boy uh, who came to us with failure to die. He has a uh, complaint of being lethargy and his sugar was quite low. It was just 28. He don't smoke resin blood and the lactate. And uh, the diagnosis of accelerated starvation was. So, Dr. Raji, uh, do you agree with the diagnosis so as what the Dr. Chetan has already elucidated so nicely that we should not take, accept a diagnosis of accelerated starvation at the face value and we should always investigate our patients for, for other detailed things and we need to take some examination and history. So we need to find out if uh, there is any organomegaly with this in this patient and uh, what about the lacrimation of this patient. If they are patients who have a lacrimia or the patient who has had a persistent vomiting might be vomiting a food par particles which he, has, he or she has ingested say within the last one week's time which is not a fresh food which is coming out. At the same time, we need to see for any uh, evidences of pigmentation in these patients. And if we find pigmentation or we find evidences of uh, a lacrimia or vomiting, which has been with uh, food particles ingested earlier, we, we should give a very detailed workup on these patients and find out what the levels of cortisol and growth hormones or the hormones in these patients. If the uh, What is the cortisol level in this patient? So the cortisol level was low. So this clearly uh, shows us that this patient is, has got an endocrine background with low cortisol levels and pigmentation in this patient. He's, he's having an okay. a, a, a endocrine problem, which could be one of the important diagnoses one need not to forget is a AAA or l group syndrome or, uh, in these patients. A AAA syndrome should also be considered. Right, so as you have mentioned that there is, uh, when we asked the parents, they uh, told us that when he cried, so alacrimia was there and uh, pigmentation was there and the cortisol was also on the lower side. Oh. So it, yes, the sodium was low and the potassium was 4.2. So yeah. as you have rightly mentioned, there was, there was triple A syndrome. Mm. So uh, what chemosages so uh, we should always be look out for these uh, grown up child uh, children for ketotic hypoglycemia uh, should consider accelerated uh, starvation but however we should not leave it as accelerated starvation until this we have fully evaluated these patients and we should look for all other causes and see telltale signs of evidences like pigmentation lacrimia etc and should get their cortisol and growth hormone levels done to come to a final diagnosis Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable input here. So I think uh, this was a wonderful discussion which happened here with regards to hypoglycemia. I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Deepak, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Chetan, Dr. Modita, and Dr. Vibha for joining us in this full uh, discussion which is there. I think hypoglycemia is one problem which is extremely common. Unfortunately, it is either missed or missed. Often we tend to not evaluate it properly or often there are issues in terms of management which happens in this perspective. So Dr. Mudita, your take about prolonged hyperinsulinism, do you think this is something which is often missed by pediatricians? Yes, sir. it is a very common scenario in India. You know, uh, whenever there is a newborn, sick newborn, SGA, the SGA baby already has risk factor of developing prolonged uh, hyperinsulinism. And uh, usually pediatricians keep on thinking that, okay, this is SGA baby, the glycogen reserve is uh, low, so the child can have hypoglycemia. But we have to look into the case carefully and look into the GIR requirement. So if the GIR requirement is very, very high, we have to rule out hyperinsulinism and that will be beyond 48 hours of life. So after 48 hours of life, we have to be very careful and not wait till seven days, 14 days. 
which was previously suggested i think a lot of people tend to give hydrocortisone as part of treatment of the chetan do you what do you have your suggestion about pediatricians who give hydrocortisone irrespective of cortisol levels in hypoglycemia yeah we often came across or we often called after they have given first dose of hydrocortisone and this is the common practice uh, even uh, some of the neonatology guidelines say uh, the large dose of uh, cortisone in mg per kg per day which can temporarily elevate the sugar but again uh, that might be due to exhausted cortisol reserves and we should not be using hydrocortisone before documenting proper cortisol deficiency uh because it will lead to a misdiagnosis of the underlying hidden hyperinsulinism or or any other cause so definitely no hydrocort uh before going for the cortisol from criti- critical sample and i think one big thing that you observed is that cortisol levels are often low in these scenarios yes. and they are not usually persistent so this is yes. again a big message that if you have a low cortisol or single value because a lot of issues in terms of infant cortisol evaluation there are issues of exhaustion you may have a false diagnosis of cortisol deficiency which is done so we have to be very very cautious in that perspective so dr deepak uh, i think uh, one of the common scenario that you were discussing also is about ketotic hypoglycemia which is often people so there are two things one in the newborn period they say it's transient nothing to worry even if it is one week there is no evaluation done the other is this ketotic hypoglycemia so what are the telltale signs that this child doesn't have ketotic hypoglycemia you need to worry more about somebody presenting at 1 to 2 years of age with hypoglycemia so any child who is presenting beyond neonatal period sir with hypoglycemia has to be investigated in my opinion because there must be some underlying cause even if we think of uh, either <clears throat> accelerated hypo, uh, this uh, ketotic hypoglycemia so big sign of for hyperinsulinism will be sir hypertomegaly uh there will be sir frequent hypoglycemia or seizures but uh, i think sir there will be history of prolonged during neonatal period that he will be ill requiring multiple episodes improving with glucose boluses so that should that history should be taken into consideration <clears throat> i think that's a very very valid and important point and a key message coming that you have to look at signs like whether there is any feature of pigmentation as uh, dr bansal talked about this become very relevant and assessment of anybody who is beyond 48 hours dr bansal the other thing which we often tend to see is miss this the routine screening of hypoglycemia so what do you think are the situations in which routine urine screening should be done for hypoglycemia i didn't get it actually you, you, some some part was missing okay so often uh, we do we expect that infants who are specially at risk of hypoglycemia should undergo a common screening in the first 48 hours but often it is not done as part of the uh, nicu practice so which condition would you recommend that we should monitor blood sugars in the first 48 hours of life oh, especially for ch which can be uh, missed uh, so ch uh, uh, is one thing which can easily be done by a spot test so i think one important thing which we can do even a galt uh, the, these neogen people are doing a galt assay uh, for uh, so galactosemia can be uh, cheaply done these two tests can be easily done with and the other thing was of course that if you have a preterm baby if you have birth asphyxia sga yeah. lga all those scenario cardiac defects you should also monitor blood sugar Ex- level yeah. in that perspective yeah yeah So I think this was a wonderful session. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Deepak, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Mudita, Dr. Chetan for joining, sparing their time and discussing about this hypoglycemia, Dr. Vibha. Again, uh, a wonderful discussion. So this has been an extensive uh, discussion that we had for the last uh, two days. We had around eight-hour sessions which were there, and we covered around one forty cases. Like total, there were total total of one forty cases which were there. people from around 30 countries have joined in and there's been a lot of discussions which were there and we will all be posting these sessions individually on youtube as well so this will be available for a long time people to follow because these are pretty much the prototype cases if you look at these 140 cases pretty much from a pediatrician's perspective we try to cover the entirety of uh, this whole session so before we conclude we like to have concluding remarks from our uh, faculty who is there Uh, who is still with us so i'll uh, request uh, dr modita to have a few words 
So uh, yes, I think when uh, with regards, first of all, I would like to thank sir for giving us the opportunity uh, to teach and simultaneously to learn on this uh, platform. And this was a wonderful arrangement of a lot of cases and presentation which was done uh, in the last two days. So I'm sure um, uh, most of the students have taken uh, advantage of the seminar. So thank, thank you, Dr. Modita. Uh, Dr. Deepak. Sir, it's a great uh, pleasure as well as honor to be with associated with you. I think nobody can learn pediatric endocrinology better than being associated with you. I rec highly recommend each and everyone if they have not already uh, taken the course to go ahead with the medi class and learn uh, pediatric endocrinology from. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Dr. Chetan. Yeah, it uh, always pleasure to be with the CDR, whether uh, virtual or or whether at Kanpur. So uh, definitely uh, this will uh, even helping me uh, by uh, revising the cases and all, all, all things. And <laughs> the main crux is the case-based discussion, uh, which is not frequently found at the uh, whole day seminar or conferences. So depending on the case, uh, you will be able to learn the theory afterwards. So this is a great, great initiative. And now we have international community, which is chipping in. So great going, Dr. Anurag, sir. And uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Chetan. Dr. Bansal? It's such a, indeed, a, always a pleasure to be associated with you. It's great learning, in fact. So uh, thank you very much for involving me and all of us for learning. Uh, every year, I enjoy your deliberations and in between also. It's such a great pleasure. And you, make, and you simplify things like anything. It's such a simplified way. I was telling my resident that you can easily now figure it out with some small the, the charts which, which you have given us. Then you can put it into your NICUs or PICUs or even your wards and uh, easily get out uh, diagnosing your patients. So indeed a pleasure and thank so, you very so much. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Dr. Bansal. In fact, I'll say that we don't even need to have those charts. You can just use the mobile app. It will immediately give you a right diagnosis, right management, doses, true, everything. True. True. So we are trying to make it even easier for across the regions as well. Dr. Somana, you are there. I think Dr. Somana is not there. Dr. Rashmi and Dr. Anjali, are you there? So if uh, they're not, they'd like to thank all the faculty who are part of the la this mega program for the last two days, all the audiences who have joined from across the various regions, our team here, Dr. Sayan, Dr. Vibha, and Dr. Dhwani, who have been here patiently, and our support staff was there. So thank all of you, and uh, we will be posting these sessions on YouTube as well, and we'll continuously to have other programs uh, that will happen frequently. The quiz, <clears throat> which did not happen th this time, will be happening in a couple of months in which we'll have two groups of quizzes, one for the basic and one for the advanced one. We'll have a prelims round followed by a final round on that. Thank you.